All right, to everyone here, it is 101, but we are still waiting for quorum. So we'll um, wait for just another council member to arrive and then we'll get started. Thank you all. Okay, it looks like we do have quorum. It is 103 and we will call to order the February 13th Public Safety Committee meeting. Uh, the first item on our agenda is the approval of our minutes from January 9th. Is there a motion for approval? Second. I have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, we now um, get to recognize um, our chairwoman, Gay Willis, who is also the chair of the human trafficking and working with um, the domestic violence task force. And we were able to have a uh, brief meeting earlier before this meeting, and I'll, I'll turn it over to her. I think, yes, I do see former council member Jennifer Gates here today. Um, always thankful when she's here and certainly for her involvement and all the many roles she still continues to to serve and to make our city better. So we thank you for being here. And I'll turn it over uh, to Councilmember Willis. Thank you so much. So today we have the opportunity to hear from Lieutenant Zafrani and Major Polk with DPD, both of whom oversee the teams and strategic initiatives fight against human trafficking in Dallas. Dallas continues to be a leader in this area and our high risk victims trafficking squad is a nationally recognized team of officers operating in Dallas to rescue juvenile victims of trafficking. We have the best team attacking this issue, but it would not be possible without the great partners that the DPD and the city work with. The Mayor's Domestic Violence and Human Trafficking Advisory Council uh, just had a, a meeting upstairs before the Public Safety Committee, and I want to draw your attention to some faces in the crowd, if you all will stand, um, who represent our nonprofits um, in the community, other members of the North Texas Coalition, so we can see, see you all and say thanks to the work that you are doing to augment what law enforcement is doing. Thank you all very much for being here today. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Dr. Britta Andercheck and her team. They're working on a new human trafficking dashboard uh, to help illustrate and track the severity and quantity of this issue that's going on in our city, uh, along with other partners like Traffic 911, New Friends, New Life, the Dallas County District Attorney's Office, and DPD, Major Dominguez, I know you're, you're here, we saw you a minute ago. 
um, who are making this dashboard a reality. And so um, I, I thank you all for being here today. We're working on how we can um, learn more about this issue and bring more light to it. I want to thank Chair Gates of, the, of this advisory um, council as well for being committed to this issue. And uh, Major Pauk and Lieutenant Zafrani are going to present the overview of human trafficking enforcement initiatives that DPD is doing. Thank you. Thank you, and so we will um, call item C, the overview of human trafficking and enforcement initiatives uh, for the presentation and discussion. Good afternoon, members of the Public Safety Committee. Um, as Councilmember Wills mentioned, um, I'm Major Devin Polk. I'm over the Special Investigations Division for the Dallas Police Department. Here with me, I have Lieutenant uh, Cyrus yeah, Safrani. I can hear you okay, but for the listening audience, if you can drag that mic closer to you. Is that better? That's much better, better. thank you. Um, with me, I have Lieutenant Cyrus Safrani, who is the uh, unit commander of the Crimes Against Children unit with DPD. Um, so we'll go ahead and get into our briefing on human trafficking uh, enforcement with the Dallas Police Department. Uh, for our presentation, uh, start out with our purpose, uh, definition, and impact of human trafficking. Uh, and then we'll go into both adult and juvenile human trafficking investigations, data, outreach, and a few success stories, as well as our next steps. Next slide, please. So our purpose is going to be to provide the public safety committee and the residents of Dallas information on human trafficking of both adults and children, human trafficking data, outreach efforts, and steps being taken by the Dallas Police Department to combat human trafficking. Next slide, please. So definition of human trafficking, and this is from the Texas Attorney General, is going to be the exploitation of men, women, and children for forced labor or sex by a third party for profit or gain. Uh, the three main forms of human trafficking that we look at are going to be sex trafficking, labor trafficking, and human smuggling. Uh, to talk briefly on victim profile, and L Lieutenant Zafrani will get into some of the high risk um, factors when we're looking at victims later. Uh, but what I think most of the biggest thing that the public and the committee need to realize is that, you know, victims of human trafficking can be anybody uh, race national origin, disability, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, socioeconomic status, none of those things matter. Human trafficking truly does touch every facet of our society. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that this is such a important issue for the Dallas Police Department. Next slide, please. Here's a graphic uh, showing some impacts of human trafficking in the state of Texas. Um, I just want to bring attention to two main points here. One, that there's an estimated 313,000 victims of human trafficking within the state of Texas. And that minor and youth sex trafficking alone costs the state of Texas approximately $6.6 .6 billion every year. And finally, the, according to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, Texas ranks number two in reported cases of human trafficking in the United States. Next slide, please. So as we delve into adult human trafficking, uh, adult human trafficking is investigated by the Vice Unit, which is part of the Special Investigations Division of the Dallas Police Department. The offenses that uh, SID investigates include uh, trafficking of persons, smuggling of persons, promotion of prostitution, online promotion of prostitution, compelling of prostitution, and prostitution. Additionally, SID detectives assist uh, the, with high-risk victim recovery when working with our partners uh, in the Crimes Against Children unit. Next slide, please. So SID uh, generates our investigations uh, from several different locations. Um, the majority of our cases start off at TIPS, whether that be from the public, from other law enforcement agencies, or from our NGO and advocate partners who are sitting behind us. Um, additionally, uh, during follow-up from other operations that we conduct, uh, sometimes we end up finding there's a human trafficking element to that, and we're able to spin up an investigation off of that. Uh, victim outcry is essential for our investigations. 
um, as well as tips that we get from the human trafficking hotline. Uh, we conduct our investigations through undercover operations, interviews, execution of search and arrest warrants, high risk victim recovery operations, as well as working with our advocate uh, partners for victim placement and services. Next slide, please. So looking at some data, um, specifically on adult human trafficking, um, as you notice from 2021 to 2022 um, on trafficking, we had a large jump from 49 cases up to 142 cases. Um, and our arrests also uh, jumped from five to 28. Um, I'm attributing a lot of that work to the partnership that SID has with the North Texas Trafficking Task Force, which is ran by Homeland Security Investigations. Uh, we've greatly increased our reach and uh, our ability to get information in order to spin up cases on human trafficking. Next slide, please. So our partnerships are uh, extensive and um, of course, as uh, Councilmember Willis mentioned, we do work with the Mayor's Domestic Violence and Human Trafficking Advisory Council. I mentioned our work with Homeland Security Investigations, Trafficking Task Force. Um, much of our outreach we coordinate with the Office of Community Affairs. And as you can see on this slide here, there are numerous NGOs that we partner with uh, day in, day out, not just to bring awareness to human trafficking, but in order to find uh, placement and services for the victims. And th this is just a highlight of the NGOs we work with. Um, we work with many others, and we will partner really with any NGO um, as they become known to us. Next slide, please. So some of the outreach um, on adult human trafficking, we've conducted PSAs with Dallas Police Department PIO. Uh, upcoming, we have the Texas Advocacy Project Roundtable. Um, we've done the Faith and Community Leaders Workshop through the Office of Community Affairs. We've conducted interviews with um, media, radio, done some podcasts, as well as uh, we've conducted numerous presentations with our local schools and businesses on human trafficking awareness. And I will close out on adult human trafficking with uh, two success stories that we've had. Uh, these, of course, are going to be sanitized in order to, you know, protect the victims. Um, but the first story, in 2021, uh, Dallas Police Department patrol officers responded to a call where a trafficking victim from her tra or ran from her trafficker's residence after the trafficker had pointed a gun to her head. The victim hid in a nearby residence and called for police. Patrol responded and located the victim. The victim was transported into Jack Evans headquarters and was interviewed by SID detectives. The suspect was arrested and a search warrant was executed at his residence. Multiple firearms and further evidence pertaining to the trafficking of persons were located. The victim elected to receive services from a local NGO. And according to the NGO, the victim has moved out of state, is currently finishing school, and is currently employed. An additional story from 2021, detectives responded to a local hospital and received information from a counselor that a patient had made an outcry to being the victim of sex trafficking. Detectives interviewed the victim at the hospital and received information that the victim had been forced to prostitute in approximately 12 different cities across the United States, all while she was pregnant. The suspect was arrested and numerous charges were filed. The victim elected to receive services from a local NGO and is continuing to work with that NGO to this day. The victim and child are doing well and the victim is in the process of enrolling in school with the assistance of the NGO. While I know these stories are, uh, are thin and there's not a lot of information we can share, it really shows the importance that we place on our victims during our trafficking investigations the fact that we will follow that through with prosecution, but really the true linchpin in all of this for these victims is the services and the help that they get from our NGO partners um, in order to get them back into society and out of the life of human trafficking. Next slide. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Zafrani. Good afternoon. I'm Lieutenant Cyrus Safrani, and I'm the commander of the Dallas Police Department's Crimes Against Children Unit, which consists of six very different squads. 
the Sex Offender Registry Squad, the Sex Offender Apprehension Program Squad, the Child Abuse Squad, the Child Exploitation Squad, the Internet Crimes Against Children Squad, ICAC, and the High Risk Victims and Trafficking Squad. The High Risk Victims and Trafficking, HRVT, Squad specializes in investigations involving the sexual abuse, human trafficking, and exploitation of children under the age of 18 who are induced into commercial sex trafficking. Now the definition of juvenile trafficking includes trafficking for the purpose of production of child pornography as well, and where adult trafficking involves the use of force, fraud, or coercion for children under 18, force, fraud, or coercion does not need to be shown. The DPD HRVT squad is a nationally recognized model and is the gold standard with a victim-centered approach. This model was created within the Dallas Police Department and is now taught at the National Criminal Justice Training Center to law enforcement agencies throughout the country. The second part of this model is that we work on each case collaboratively with a multidisciplinary team, an MDT, which includes other local, state, and federal partners, children's advocacy centers, and many nonprofit organizations providing aftercare to our victims. These partnerships work together to provide access to resources, crime victims compensation, clothing, food, financial assistance to the families, because we know that many times that is where the need is for our victims. And they provide the victim with case coordination, clinical services, and physical, psychological, and spiritual therapy and support. Much of this coordination starts at the DCAC, the Dallas Children's Advocacy Center, which already houses the Dallas Police Department's Child Abuse Squad, the Child Protective Services, and the Dallas County Juvenile Prosecutor. There's a note at the bottom that says, data on human trafficking is difficult to ascertain and existing information focuses almost exclusively on identified victims. And that um, is very true because all we get to see is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, like the slide before said, it's a $6.6 .6 billion uh, hit to the economy of Texas. Juvenile human trafficking, in 2019, the Institute of Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault at the University of Texas, Austin, conducted a uh, qualitative and quantitative research study on juvenile sex trafficking and determined the at-risk factors shown correlated with the increased risk of sex trafficking, not necessarily causes, but risks. And not all juveniles who exhibit these risk factors are exploited. But these risk factors include history of emotional or sexual abuse, history of homelessness, insecurity of food, shelter, safety, clothing, transportation, etc. History of running away from home, history of involvement with child welfare systems or the foster care. Victims amongst tra sex trafficking are 25% uh, members of the LGBTQ community. Uh, correction, the LGBT community is 25% uh, of the LGBTQ community becomes uh, sex trafficking victims. 18% of females become sex trafficking victims and 7% of males. Uh, next slide, please. The lack of healthy, trusted relationship in victims' lives and their economic stability create ideal conditions for exploitation through force, fraud, or coercion. Next slide. I think you want to go back one. The high-risk victim status is met based on the following criteria. Run away for more than 30 consecutive days or more than four times in a 12-month period. This criteria was established by the Texas Senate Bill 742 and House Bill 1793 and is a category for high-risk factors for missing juveniles under the Code of Criminal Procedure 63.51. Second risk factor is runaways who are 12 years of age or younger. This criteria was created by the Dallas Children's Advocacy Center and is based upon pubescent age. Children with two or more separate incidents of sexual abuse or exploitation, children who are identified as a prior victim of sex trafficking, and other risk factors including drug use, sexual abuse, housing instability, immigration status, or child experiences of domestic violence or neglect. These risk factors come from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Next slide. Due to the complex nature of this crime, traffickers often operate under the radar. Juvenile victims do not see themselves as victims and often create bonds with the traffickers who have groomed and psychologically manipulated their victims over a long period of time. 
This is now easier and easier with the use of uh, social media applications and technology. Trends show when children run away frequently for, or for long periods of time, they tend to be running from an unsafe situation or an unsafe uh, home. Victims continuously consider the cost versus benefit of staying or leaving and seeking help. Mental and physical health costs and costs on public service sectors, uh, if we refer back to that uh, uh, slide, is $6.6 .6 billion in the state of Texas. Next slide. Traffickers' methodology and correlation between CSAM, which is child sexual abuse material, commonly known as child pornography, and trafficking. Child sex traffickers utilize numerous websites, internet chat rooms, social media apps, and gaming platforms to meet and groom their victims. Abusers and traffickers use child pornogra pornographic images to introduce sexual topics, normalize the act for their victims, and portray a sense of normalcy and social acceptance. Through known studies, approximately 65% of individuals arrested for possession of child pornography have sexually assaulted at least one child in the past. In many cases, the victims are family members and friends. This assault creates a trafficking risk factor for the child. Over time, the perpetrators produce, trade, or sell CSAM of their victims to others, and in some cases, trade and traffic their victims themselves. This is known as familial trafficking. Next slide. Before we go into the slide, I wanted to talk about um, the other DPD investigations that assist with human trafficking, and that's uh, Internet Crimes Against Children, the ICAC squad. The Dallas Police Department's ICAC squad investigates technology facilitated child sexual exploitation and Internet crimes against children. We're the lead agency for the North Texas ICAC Task Force, which spans over 112 counties and nearly 400 affiliate agencies and is one of the largest in the national network of 61 task forces. In we investigated over 22,000 cyber tips received from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in 2022. And those investigations were for, for production, distribution, possession of child sexual abuse material, and child pornography or lewd visual material. We also investigate online solicitation of minors and sexual performance by a child, which both lead into child sex trafficking. So that's some of the work that we're doing uh, through ICAC to try to um, stop sex trafficking before the children actually hit the roads and are trafficked in person. Our stats for 2022, there were 247 uh, trafficking cases investigated, 64 arrests, and 101 children recovered. Uh, that is a number that we take pride in, and with each recovery, we know uh, the importance of the work that, that we do. 30 of those uh, recovered victims have been reported as runaways. 16 were from out of county or out of state, meaning that the rest of those 101 victims were not necessarily reported as runaways. Our partnerships include the Dallas Children's Advocacy Center and all advocacy centers, Traffic 911, Refuge City, New Friends, New Life, and Homeland Security Investigations in North Texas Trafficking Task Force. <clears throat> Next slide. Education and outreach. Uh, education and outreach, uh, the unit is staffed with a full-time education and outreach officer who develops, schedules, and presents cyber safety topics, child sexual abuse, exploitation, and trafficking recognition to teenagers, teachers, coaches, caregivers, parents, and community leaders. We conducted over 420 presentations in 2022 to more than 16,000 attendees. We also educate law enforcement partners and other multidisciplinary team partners. The DPD, ICAC, and high-risk victims trafficking detectives are re revered as subject matter experts in their field by their peers across the country and regularly present at, and teach at law enforcement conferences across the nation on topics related to their fields, as well as case studies highlighting the complexity of, and magnitude of these cases that they work. Next slide, please. All right, so finishing up with our next steps, um, we're currently in progress on the uh, Human Trafficking Needs Assessment Grant with University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, that'll be completed here within the next uh, month or two. Um, and finally, um, we'll be standing up a human trafficking squad in Special Investigations Division, um, focusing on adult human trafficking. 
Um, the vice detectives in SID, you know, currently have uh, multiple responsibilities uh, within their job, so we will actually be getting a squad dedicated solely to working on adult human trafficking. Next slide. And that concludes our presentation, and we'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, I appreciate the presentation. There's some really heartbreaking <laughs> data in there, um, but I'm also incredibly thankful for the work that y'all do, um, certainly not for everybody. Um, also, just as a opening question, and then I'm gonna pass it to the committee, we do have some truly amazing um, organizations that are here that, as mentioned in the presentation, you partner with and are working with, I believe, more and more. Um, recently aware of, of even Refuge City and my friend Ron Cross working with doing some process mapping and identifying different areas where new information is coming out where we can leverage, again, additional resources and just learning what the, what the county's doing, what DPD's doing, what the different entities are doing, and, and then trying to fill those gaps. And so the question there is how do we further that and how do we further it more quickly? Um, because as you mentioned, the 101 that we saved, there's so many more out there. And um, you know, it's just a, it's, it's, what, what can we do better from this perspective and from our committee's support of the work you're doing? Absolutely. So, um, you know, over the last couple of years, I think we have uh, made great, great strides uh, in building those relationships. We're to the point where our detectives um, are on a first name basis with uh, a lot of the NGOs sitting behind us. And, um, you know, we call them at two in the morning. And when they see the detective's name come across their phone, they pick up the phone. Uh, we regularly uh, have office visits with them. We go to their offices and, and vice versa, and we share a lot of information. Um, you know, I, I think the true way to tackle uh, specifically child sex trafficking is through education, and we can't do it as from a law enforcement uh, perspective uh, by ourselves, and so their involvement is, is very valuable, and I think uh, we have done a good job of bringing everyone together at the same table. Thank you. Um, open it up to committee for any questions or comments. Yes, uh, Chairwoman Willis. Thank you. I'm glad to see under next steps you've got the human trafficking squad. Um, is that something that is funded separately or were you all able to make that happen within this year's budget? Is more funding needed? Tell me about that. <clears throat> so this squad's gonna be just reassigning work within SID. Uh, like I said, the, the detectives that work human trafficking are you know, assigned with vice, so they, they're working gambling, they're working alcohol, TABC complaints, you know, they have a lot on their plate. So it's just going to be moving some of that uh, responsibility to detectives that will be working on that as their dedicated job. Well, on slide eight, you talked about um, the difference between trafficking cases between 2021 and 2022 and such a big increase due to communication with Homeland Security, et cetera. I mean, do you expect that to climb? I'm just, I'm looking, thinking ahead to next year's budget and what we not, might need to prepare for if you're feeling like that level of communication is yielding more cases uh, that would need attention. I think that's part of it that yet, you know, the work with, with our federal partners has definitely generated more work. Um, I also think it's part of the, the education, you know, even as Lieutenant Safrani talked about, that really is, I think, one of the most important things in this fight against human trafficking is education. And I think as more people are becoming educated, it is creating more, uh, more leads and more cases that need to be followed up on. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Councilmember Moreno. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple questions. We'll start off on page five. You mentioned Texas being the second highest. Is that overall, is that percentage population? How is it, how is it measured? Is it overall or is it? Uh... it it's overall. So, so uh, number one state is going to be California, and then we follow as number two. Okay. We talked a little bit about human trafficking or, or forced labor. Is there any correlation that y'all have seen uh, when the city implements a day labor center to protect uh, some of those workers, ensuring that they are, are paid fair wages, that, they're, that they are not taking advantage of. Have y'all done a study on day labor centers? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have any data on that, Council Member. Okay. 
on page seven, you talked about tips from the public. Um, as we have a rise uh, in short-term rentals, is there a correlate? Do y'all see more calls coming in on short-term rentals with human trafficking tips? Uh, we have received a few uh, additional tips, uh, I think since the publicity of the short-term rental investigation that we had that culminated in Plano, um, but it's not a, a huge number uh, that we've seen. Okay. Page eight, we talk about, we're seeing that trafficking cases are on the rise, but prostitution cases are climbing. Can you help me understand when we have first responders coming uh, upon what appears to be prostitution, what is the, what are the line of questioning? How do we determine prostitution versus human trafficking cases? The, when it comes to the difference between prosecution, or me, prostitution and human trafficking, uh, you know, my detectives conduct thorough investigations uh, with any sex trafficking worker or sex worker that they come in contact with. Um, some of those that are handled more on the quality of life side with street prostitution, many of them actually become, uh, make an outcry and actually we are then able to assist them in getting out of the life, getting them hooked up with resources, eventually putting their trafficker in prison and getting them out of the life. So it's like I said, we're, we look at every, uh, every individual we come at with that victim mindset. Unfortunately, there's some that don't want the help. Um, and we have to combat all sides of sex trafficking, you know, both on supply and demand. I think, I think that answers the question. And, and, and I just wanted to be assured that our officers were asking the, looking for the right triggers and asking the right questions when, when they come into a situation. Yes, we do. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Atkins. Just a couple of questions. Number one, when we talk about human trafficking, um, the success story, um, the recovery, what is the percentage that, that do take recoveries um, during the, the trafficking of prosecution case? Uh, do we pro provide wraparound service? Do we get any of the data that said when you got 200 something people trafficking of X amount of prosecution, what is the recovery? What, is, what does that data show us? Are we one out of every 20, one out of every 40, a recovery of what? I, I'm talking about, I look on page eight, but but, I, I, but you talk about a success story, I'm just trying to find out if there's something that we missing, you know, do we need wraparound service, they need more help? There, there is a very, very low number of turnaround. I think a lot of it, at least on the, the adult side council member is, um, you know, the, a lot of these victims are controlled, you know, by their trafficker. And we have victims that we can encounter two, three, four times that, you know, either we offer services or we may even get them uh, help with services, but they end up falling off the bandwagon, falling back into trafficking and, you know, re-victimized again. Um, so it's, it's difficult, uh, but it's something that we continually push to you know, get as many of these victims out of the life as we can. Is, is there a reason why um, in the past we had a prosecu prosecu prostitute diversion, you know, over there off of I-20 and, and Bonneville many, many years ago? We don't do that diversion anymore. Is there a reason why we stopped doing that? The, the PDI in its older um, forms uh, was ended before I took this position. I don't know the reason that we don't continue that. However, uh, we do partner with Dallas County both in their, um, their victim diversion and their John diversion when it comes to prostitution. Uh, the majority of it is done on the backside uh, after they're injected into the legal system. I guess 
talked to system manager, John Fortune, is there any reason why we stopped that and the reason why we cannot continue doing that, because it was a good project. Uh, we did have wraparound service. We did partnership with the county. I'm just curious why we stopped doing that. I mean, it was, it was a great tool in the toolbox. I'm trying to find out why we took that tool out of the toolbox. So thank you, Councilmember uh, Atkins. And we certainly do think that there's probably some value in looking at that program again. I know I'm working with community courts. That was a successful program in the past. And so I'm happy to visit with the team and, and see what support and services they may need to be able to implement those type of programs and put them in our, in our arsenal. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, virtually, uh, Councilmember Resendez. My question is, is on the, the juvenile um, human trafficking piece. Uh, let's say you have a parent, right, who has a child that um, has some of those risk factors that were mentioned. Uh, or, or, you know, they may be on the brink of something, you know, way worse. Uh, you know, they may have caught them sneaking out of the house or something like that, or caught them with a, an, an older individual. What are the best next steps? Are there any resources for a parent who is in that situation? Thank you, Council Member. So, uh, you know, education again, when it, especially when it comes to parents, uh, you have to recognize what your children are doing. Uh, you know, in the past, the concern was who are they meeting when they go to the mall or who are they meeting outside of school. Now it's who are they playing video games with. Uh, you know, on, on different platforms and who are they talking with on, on social media. And so uh, getting a good grasp of understanding of what it is that your children are doing inside your own home uh, on their uh, devices is important. And that's uh, one way to lead into um, understanding of any risk factors they may have. Again, just because they meet some of those uh, high risk fa factors that we spoke about doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they're going to be trafficked. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the, the risk factors are there, and if the opportunity presents itself, then, then they're at, at risk. So education, uh, like I said, we uh, conducted uh, over 420 uh, training events last year. Um, you know, finding one of those and attending it gives you a great insight into what it is that traffickers are, are looking for and how they go about uh, finding their next victims. But there's no specific uh, organization or specific number if a parent is in that situation and they just want to take yes, take all the precautions necessary before things get worse. And there are some I can I can put a list together and, and provide that to uh, to the council members. Okay, sounds good. And I think we should put put it out to the public too, so that people know what resources are available if, if they're in that situation. Those those are all my comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Thomas. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I want to say uh, thank you for bringing this uh, to us and everyone who's working in this space. Um, it's very sobering, very sobering information. Um, you know, and unless it's one of us or someone that we know, you know, oftentimes uh, you know it's just just another headline. But when you look at uh, the data and you look at um, how many people are more affected by this? It really says a lot. So I just wanted to. I don't have a lot of questions. I just want to say I'm here to here to help. You know, whatever role I can play and be supportive of, of those who are here today who are doing this work on a day to day basis, um, and those of you who are um, serving in law enforcement but that's having to you know deal with this. Uh, you have my full support. And whatever I can do to be helpful, let me know. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Mendelson. Thank you. <clears throat> um, thank you for the very important work you're doing. Uh, I did a ride along with ICE and it was extremely eye opening. Saw a lot of things I didn't expect to see, to tell you the truth. Um, I want to say thank you to all our partners up there. Um, one of the things I saw in the ride along was exactly how closely you're working together. And I don't think DPD could be as successful as they are without you. And I don't know if you could be as successful without them. So I think y'all have found a great way to work together. I want to say thank you to Councilmember Willis for all the work she's doing on this. Thank you. Um, you know, I think you're hearing comments about how sad and difficult this work is, but one of the things that struck me was really how dangerous and extremely violent it is. And um, the risks that you are taking even to save 
um, in this case, um, many women that um, I saw taken out of sexual slavery. Um, can you share with the public the phone number to report if somebody has a suspicion of human trafficking? Yeah, uh, council member, the national uh, human trafficking hotline is 1-888-373-7888. And that's the best way to get a tip to you? Uh, it can be done that way, or of course, you can call 911 um, and here in Dallas, and that is the best way, you know, in an emergency situation to get in contact with us. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments, committee? Anybody else? Okay, with that, uh, thank you for this update, this presentation to all the partners that were here. Thank you for spending your time today. We look forward to following up, and as uh, Chairwoman Willis mentioned, any follow-up that we need from you, please continue to, to work with us and connect on that front. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move um, back to item B on our agenda, which is the Violent Crime Reduction Plan update. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, as the team makes their way to the uh, podium, um, this is our monthly update on the Violent Crime Reduction Plan, and I believe Major Scoggins will be taking the lead on this. And of course, we have the uh, command staff available for questions following the presentation. Can you hear me now? Now we got you. All right. Good afternoon. I'm Major Jason Scoggins, and this is our presentation on the Violent Crime Reduction Plan update. Presentation is going to cover our grid crime numbers. Then we're going to go into how the grid crime numbers uh, impact overall crime move into the crime trends, then we'll discuss violent crime and our social responsibility aspect. Then we'll hear from Integrated Public Safety Solutions, Mr. Oden. Then we'll go into our crime plan next steps. So on our grid crime by the numbers, January has been a little bit of a, for grid, January hasn't been as much of a challenge as it has been for the rest of the city. But we're looking at 12 less victims uh, as far as the grids go and no business robberies at the, at the moment. Next page. So this is our total crime. And through the end of January, we sit at an increase of 5.99%. When you break it down, our homicides are up 9.52%. And what that translates to is two more victims than what we had through, the, uh, through January of last year. And although one victim is still too many, um, number still kind of low. The family violence uh, aspect of the homicides, we are at three less victims than we were last year. And in non-family violence, we're at five more. Looking at the aggravated assaults, basically it translates into 91 more victims than what we had last year. Uh, family violence is only uh, 12 more victims, and non-family violence is 79 more victims. And on the trend lines, we'll get into that a little bit more. Now, our robberies be the kind of the highlight. Right now, we're sitting at minus 45 uh, victims, minus 33 victims as it translates into business robberies, and then minus 12 on individual robberies. Next slide. 
Okay, so what I want to focus here on our trend line is something that hasn't really happened until now. Uh, towards the end, the right-hand side of the trend line, it's going up. And this is a victim count uh, trend line. So keep that in mind as we go to the next slide. Our incident count, same time period, is going down. What that means is we're having less incidents, but more victims. Uh, the rough numbers on that would be six shooting incidents with 75 victims. Uh, apartments occupied 15 times, nine times, 10 times. Uh, residents about the same. So the incidents are low, but very populated areas. And basically, it's incidents that arise out of conflict, one way or another, conflict, argument, something. Next slide. So as we discussed, our homicides were up 9.52%. Uh, That's two more victims than what we had last year. And this is about the same as our aggravated assaults, is the rate is being driven by uh, heated emotions, argument, conflict, people trying to resolve their issues by shooting other people. Next slide. Robberies, as, uh, as we discussed, business robberies down almost 60%, which is very, very nice. Uh, overall down a little over 20%. Next slide. And then our aggravated assaults, and as we as we already discussed that as well. Less, vic or less incidents, way more victims, which translates into almost 15% up for the year. Next slide, please. Now the good news. Our uh, PSN officers, let me back up. Farmers Branch put out a bulletin on capital murder suspects um, several weeks ago. Uh, I believe there's four or five suspects that were wanted for capital murder, and one of which was found in Dallas. Uh, and then our PSN officers, while reviewing uh, social media, happened to see some things in the background of a post of one of our suspects. They had a history with this suspect. They've arrested him for aggravated robbery numerous times, and they know about where he stays and what he does. In the, throughout the investigation, it was discovered what kind of car they were in. Officers flooded that area. Uh, five points, they found the car. Um, story gets a little interesting here. They follow the car up close to a Chick-fil-A. As many of us probably know, there was a long line Chick-fil-A. So it gave time for one of our PSN officers to talk to the manager, acquire a jacket, said so Chick-fil-A on it, in which time he had the opportunity to serve the suspect his food. Mainly, why is this important? He needed to confirm that this capital murder suspect was actually in this car. He did that. He served his food. Um, they continued the surveillance operation all the way to his apartment, which is there on Shady Brook. Uh, while watching the apartment, they noticed that there was actions of illegal sales of narcotics and other criminal type actions. Uh, they ended up getting the suspect and the other people in the apartment to come out uh, simply by loud hailing or loudly asking them to come out safely, uh, at which time they had them in custody. After a search warrant, uh, this is what they found. Uh, AK-47 with two magazines, uh, two pistols, uh, almost 37 pounds of marijuana, uh, a little over 38 grams of cocaine, 32 grams of THC wax, two grams of ecstasy, cell phones, and some other stuff. Um, I mean, that's pretty significant when you're looking at a guy for a warrant and all of a sudden you end up with three other uh, felony arrests that, that accompany it. Next page, please. Next slide. 
our social uh, responsibility aspect, our ACT team, our apartment communities team, uh, teamed up with Northwest MPO, uh, went to Medrano Middle School, which is near the Webb Chapel p and we've been talking about. Uh, had coffee and met with the principal and parents uh, and students who attended the school. Uh, from what I understand, it was very successful. They, uh, everybody had a good time. Next slide, please. At this point, I would like to pass it over to uh, Mr. Oden. I'll work on the t-shirt. <laughs> good afternoon, uh, council and city manager. Um, I want to give three quick uh, items that we don't often talk about in, in our update, but I, I think they're noteworthy for this committee nonetheless. Uh, at the, about three weeks ago, we launched our second crisis intervention team that's responding to live 911 calls. These are uh, civilian social workers. Uh, they are operating out of the Southeast Patrol Division. So that takes us North Central and Southeast. As we have been monitoring our data, we are seeing more than 80% of mental health calls that are coming into our city have a licensed social worker on them, right? So we're seeing great uptick on that and we're excited about what the future is gonna bring for that program. Uh, secondly, I want to give credit to our right care team. Uh, during the freeze, our right care team continued operating. Over those three days, they answered more than 70 calls for service, uh, including one of those being on the call where the missing uh, monkeys uh, from the zoo uh, were involved with that that individual and then finally as we as we get into our discussion of crime prevention uh, right now today we have a crime prevention class going on uh, here at City Hall we've got 50 uh, city employees either from DPD from code from our community prosecutors all taking that course together uh, with the hope to continue to improve properties within our city and, and uh, deter future acts of crime in four of our five risk terrain focus areas, we continue to see crimes and calls for service lessen. There is one where there's a bit of an uptick and the major kind of went over some of the challenges we're facing on that front in his slide. Our nuisance abatement unit continued great productivity in January, 78 investigations. Again, when we say investigations by nuisance abatement, these are high crime properties. These are properties with lots of demand on 911, on 311 and others, right? So our team goes in, they investigate, uh, and they try to bring uh, better outcomes and better environmental design of properties uh, to lower crime rates. And then third, I wanna highlight the work of our team in the South Central area, an area near and dear uh, to Chairman Atkins' heart. Uh, we recently begun an engagement uh, around a convenience store and an apartment where the two are, are linked uh, prior to our engagement uh, in that location, there was a lot of loitering, a lot of drug sales um, and other activities going on. 30 criminal offenses uh, were registered in that area. And since we began engagement in that area in December, there have only been two. Uh, you can see on the slide on the right, uh, the IPS camera trailer that has been out there and helping uh, deter crime while we work with ownership to make those gains long lasting. Next slide. Uh, briefly on our urban blight abatement, um, our numbers continue to hold steady. I mean, this is generally what you see uh, month to month, even though January was a bit uh, colder uh, month and we had some, uh, some snaps there. Uh, we remediated dozens of violations, identified even more, um, and worked several substandard structure cases. I want to bring your attention on the outdoor public lighting improvements. Uh, we have placed an order for 1,934 new outdoor public lighting improvements. Those are dispersed kind of throughout the city, um, and we're excited to see uh, additional gains and upgrades on Encore poles, on city poles, and we're actually working with CPAL, our partner in this, and some academics on uh, how do we continue to quantify the impacts of outdoor public lighting improvements on nighttime crime rates. Next slide. You see our metrics for community violence intervention. What I want to highlight, um, and really due to the leadership of, of Ms. Sandra Saduk, who's our, our program manager for violence intervention, uh, there was an incident in December where a 14-year-old shot an 11-year-old at an a, apartment complex in Dallas. Um, and we quickly rallied together with the city and partners in the community 
um, to serve that family and the impacts uh, of that incident, not only on the family, but the, the, the broader community. Uh, there were memorials, balloon releases, direct services to the family. Uh, and I just want to credit all those that uh, are work in the space of violence intervention for helping uh, with the best positive outcome you could have in a situation such as that. Uh, finally, on our community engagement, uh, we've closed out our operations at uh, four properties. You see those listed there. Uh, what I would highlight to you is, is now it's time to start ramping up our property work. Uh, we will be taking on seven new properties that we are assessing. Currently, we're working with the PNI team on how that uh, works. We feel at this point we've got a process that raises quality of life it lowers crime rates, and it makes sustainable gains at properties for the police department as well as our residents. Uh, we're carrying three properties forward to February that we had been working. Typically, we do about a 60-day uh, cycle at a property. So that's where we sit on that, and we'll just pass it back over to Major Scoggins. Thank you, sir. All right. So for our crime plan, our next steps, um, we'll go over our place network investigations. Uh, that begins with a problem-focused investigation designed to uncover, identify, and disrupt the criminal networks uh, that contribute to the violent crime in Dallas. Uh, the PNI board is made up with stakeholders, government uh, stakeholders such as government agent or government agencies, Office of Integrated Public Solutions, Code Enforcement, Parks and Recreation. The board is designed to work together to address crime and its causes within the crime place network. Uh, we have a recent example of how this works um, from 3550 East Overton. Uh, I was involved in the incident uh, in which Mr. Oden just talked about the, uh, the shooting involving two juveniles. Uh, our officers were out there uh, and due to, um, due to the partnerships and connections that we've made over time at 3550 East Overton, uh, one of our officers received a complaint regarding uh, narcotic sales. Uh, so we started working that complaint. Uh, that was back in December of 22. Um, basically, we had our bike team go out there. They surveyed the area, found uh, surveillance cameras and other things. Uh, our P&I detective uh, ran surveillance on the area, uh, saw that uh, there was evidence of drug sales, such as the complaint uh, outlined. So that was one step to confirming uh, what was given to us. Uh, next step was to uh, have patrol officers do pickoffs of prospective buyers. Next, to basically to confirm that these people were there to buy drugs. Uh, we utilized a uh, CI to make a uh, buy and which uh, they secured a drug buy. So all this put together allowed us to get a uh, search warrant. And when that search warrant was executed on January 20th, uh, they found quite a bit, 517.7 grams of marijuana, uh, a little over 18 and a half grams of methamphetamine, a pistol with two magazines, and other evidence uh, that's consistent with the sales of narcotics. Uh, that partnership paid off big by taking care of a drug dealer and getting a potential violent uh, suspect off the streets that day. And I believe that whole thing is, is, is gonna translate into a federal complaint for him as well. Um, so that's an example of this thing still working. Although Overton is still, it, it's in a maintenance phase, we're still working it. We're still out there, we're still trying to make a difference. Uh, Phase seven grids, they ended on January 31st. Uh, we launched phase eight grids on February 1st, total of 50 grids. And then our focus deterrence aspect, uh, we're in a process of planning. Uh, and what this includes is we're scheduling meetings with city partners and community partners. Uh, also scheduling meetings with the Dallas County District Attorney's Office, uh, probation and uh, pardon and parole board members. Um, at this point, I will turn it over to Chief Garcia for closing comments. Just to have some closing comments, and uh, Executive Assistant Chief Anderson will have some comments as well. Uh, but one of the dynamics, obviously, as we look, um, and as was highlighted earlier, is really the amount of incidents compared to victims. You know, as we look 
uh, and I know we're talking about just the month of January. If you look at the month of January, we had the lowest incident count as it pertains to ag assault, homicide, and robbery incidents that we've had in five years. Unfortunately, we've had several incidents. One, one shooting incident uh, equaled 19 victims. And as Major Scoggins pointed out, six shooting, vic six shooting incidents uh, equated to 76 victims. One of the dynamics that we're working with, obviously, with the criminologists and is that our goal is to reduce the incidents. And then by reducing incidents, we'll reduce victims. Uh, but again, unfortunately, we've had some incidents that just have had a lot of victims tied to it, although the men and women are doing an amazing job to reducing those incidents that would have given us more. Um, but I'm gonna turn it over to Executive uh, Assistant Chief Anderson to uh, dive in a little bit more with the data. Good afternoon, committee. To really kind of look and give you guys some perspective regarding the uh, reporting system that we utilize, which is the NIBR system. Um, it really was implemented to improve the overall quality of crime data collected by law enforcement. Um, it details each single incident. And what I mean by that, if there are several other incidents, several other offenses under, one, under that incident, it is also documented as well too. It looks at the victims, known offenders, time of the day, and, uh, offenders and arrestees. And for example, if somebody shoots into a resident and the attended target is in the front living room, but there's five other people in the rear bedroom, then the attended target gets classified as ag assault. The unintended consequences, which is the five additional individuals that's in the rear bedroom, gets classified as a daily conduct. But daily conduct is part of the category of aggravated assaults. And when I talk about daily conducts, daily conduct occurs when a person recklessly engages in a conduct that places another in imminent danger of seriously bodily injury. And that's exactly what happens with those other individuals that's in that residence, such as in a road rage incident where the target is a driver of the vehicle, but there's two additional people in the rear, in the rear seats. Then the driver of the vehicle gets classified as aggravated assault. The two in the rear seat gets classified as daily conduct but Daly's conduct is included in the overall counting of aggravated assaults. Another prime example, there's a shooting at a bar, a late night bar. The intended target is this individual here, but there's five other individuals that are standing behind him. Because of the behavior of the suspect placed him in intimate danger of surgery bodily injury, then you have the intended target as an ag assault, and then you have the five other individuals as deadly conduct, which is counted in their overall count. And so for perspective, uh, looking at January 1st through February the 10th, there were about 685 victims of ag assaults. 225 of those were deadly conduct. So this lens to the lens of this is why it's so important that we have relentless follow up on our side, where when we have these ends to happen, it's important for our men and women, they do a fantastic job to understand what are those underlying conditions that are contributing to this type of behavior. And that's something we've done since the day one of our crime plan, and the focus will always be on preventing and being proactive so we won't have these incidents, so therefore we can have less victims and we reverse the trend. And so I just want to share that perspective with you. You know, one last piece, you know, obviously our goal is to have less victims in our city. There's no question about it. Um, and uh, as opposed, you know, and we're a month in, uh, we're not sitting as a department hoping that it's going to go down because of we're reducing incidents. Uh, hope, as we know, is the worst uh, type of uh, strategy to have. And so obviously we're looking using data as we always do, drilling down on every part of the data with regards to not only what we're looking at so that we can separate fact from fiction, the incidents, uh, but look, uh, you know, the reality of it is our Southwest or Southeast, uh, our Southeast Patrol Division has been uh, a challenge for us this last month. Uh, but we're not sitting back. We're sending our resources. Um, and ex as an example, from in addition to a ca camera technology, using the Fusion Real-Time Crime Center, our DOI unit, our MPOs, our motors, gangs, narcotics, our CRTs, canines, and our mounted unit. Uh, we're all trying to move resources around to ensure that we have proper um, you know, visibility uh, in certain areas so that we can continue to reduce incidents, which we know when we feel uh, in uh, coordination with what the science says that will ultimately reduce uh, our victims as well. So again, um, you know, obviously the work that the men and women have done, tremendous work in the last two years uh, to reduce violent crime in two years consecutively, but there are challenges and there are successes. 
Uh, and the police department needs to look at where we have had successes because we've had successes this month, but we've had challenges as well. And look, uh, using our data and coming up with plans, specific plans, uh, to really try to uh, uh, reduce. Obviously, the trend line, we want the trend line to match. We want the victim trend line to match with our incident trend line. Uh, but we truly believe by reducing incidents that we will make that happen. So with that, we'll open up to questions. So thank you, Chief, and um, I appreciate the update and, I, and also the explanation. I mean, I think, as you said, it's, it's all about our victims, but it's also helpful to understand how those numbers come about. And I'm, I, for one, think that we're doing the right thing as it relates to how you describe, you know, identifying all the additional victims surrounding each incident and uh, tracking that. But as we also have been looking at comparisons to other cities and large cities across the country, um, are, do all the large cities across the country track it in the same way, or do they track it differently? Thank you for the question, uh, Chair. I, I will say that no, they do not. Um, not all major cities, uh, particularly the major cities of, of the United States, report using NIBRS. Uh, a lot are, have not yet transitioned from completely from the UCR reporting method. Um, and that is something, I just had a, uh, a meeting with the FBI director last week that they're trying to get all cities to get online with NIBRS. Uh, because obviously, you know, the best, the best definition that I can give for NIBRS in addition to what Chief Anderson gave is, take as an example, you have a carjacking. You have a robbery, uh, a murder occurred, uh, and there was a sexual assault, all related to the, to the carjacking. Well, under the old UCR method, you just report the highest level of crime. So under UCR, you would just report the murder. Under NIBRS, you would report each one of those crimes which is one of the ways that the FBI was trying to get us all on board to really have an apples to apples comparison uh, when we're doing these. Um, but it's taken some cities a little bit longer. Uh, we've transitioned to NIBRS, I believe, in February of 18. Uh, but there are still some major cities, um, some larger than ours, that have not yet uh, gone to NIBRS completely. So no, it's not necessarily an apples to apples, but I will say that we are, we are, we are using in a lot more, in other cities as well, are using, are using the robust NIBRS method uh, to truly try to capture all the, all the violent crime that's occurring. Well, that was my other question is when we transitioned, because I remember that transition and it was a difficult process and trying to compare trends before and after has, was, was difficult through that, but I, I feel like where we are now, our comparisons are accurate. And so as we see this, even though it, it, there, there's explanation for some of the separating graphs, I think that's helpful for us all to understand. So thank you for that background. I have several questions, but I'm gonna wait and let the committee go. I'll go to uh, Chairman Atkins first. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chief. On, on page 12, I just want to give you, Chief, um, and your staff a great uh, kudos to you and your staff for uh, the crying on Bonneville and Simpson Stewart. They've been a hot spot. You're going to visit this every many times. And, and Kevin, you've been there, but you see the difference when you do get engaged. You, you see 30 crime offenses, now they're down to two. So it goes to show that when you attack that grid, it do go down. You know, Thank you for doing that. Uh, on page uh, 13, uh, the outdoor public lighting improvement. Have we got with transportation and tried to change some of those lighting to LED lighting? So what is our engagement with transportation? I know we got quite a bit of lighting, but LED lighting is something we've been asking for constant and constant. So where are we with that? So those, those 1900 upgrades are all conversions from traditional to LED lighting either on city poles or encore poles. Do we have a map that says which pole is city and which one is encore? Because we don't know the difference because some is a city and some is encore. Uh, we, could we get a map to show you know which one we changing? We, we do have that. Uh, I believe some of that information is also public on the encore's website, but I'd be happy to get with you after this meeting and make sure you have access to that, sir. And, and what is the timeline to change those out? Uh, if we're doing somewhere in the range of 150 to 200 a month, uh, generally is what we're doing. Um, so 1,900 will um, it'll it'll take a minute at that rate. Uh, I think one of the things that we've had discussions with Encore about that they've been very frank that they want to do is help us with more crews. So I think we can get that number up, but I don't want to commit to anything today that I don't have full control over. 
Yeah, and, and I know that it's not just change the light bulb, it's change the whole complete fixture. Is that correct? So That's correct. do we have a supply chain? Is those been ordered or the back order or what? The no, 1900. Sir, that, that was an issue uh, last year, um, which is why some of our lighting that we ordered last year carried over into this year. Um, but my understanding of the situation is that has improved considerably uh, as we've turned the calendar to 2023. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Mendelson. Thank you. Major Scoggins, thank you for the report. Um, I appreciate you pointing out that we have less incidences, which we're all really glad about, but unfortunately more victims, which we are broken hearted over. If I had to choose, I would do it the other way, right? We want less victims. So I guess my first question is, are you finding that um, these high victim incidences are happening in highly dense areas, special events, it's just random? I mean, do you have a sense of that? I think for the most part, uh, they've been pretty random at an apartment complex, or there's been some at uh, residences, uh, and then as Chief alluded to, at nightclubs. Uh, I was looking through some of the numbers and there's been incidents uh, that occurred in technically public and in incidents that occurred uh, into residence or, or, or apartments. Um, up until the recent incidents of, uh, I guess, last weekend, uh, we, were able to, we were able to deploy officers uh, strategically to try to uh, minimize the amount of victims and I believe our efforts uh, save that number from climbing up even more. Uh, there was an on, there's been an ongoing uh, deal with, uh, with, with some folks. And I don't want to say that it's a particular area of town because it could, it could you know, get another city in there as well. But we have some people that uh, have an ongoing issue. And uh, unfortunately, that is driving the number of victims a lot higher than what we want. So in your example, you used apartments. You've just said apartments a number of times. Um, when we talk about where crime is, apartments are always the number one. I've asked privately, you guys have said apartments are much higher than our next category, which is convenience stores. But yet our housing strategy is to um, increase density through multifamily housing. And I'm wondering how these two are in conflict when we say we want to reduce crime, but the location of crime continues to be apartments. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions on that? I think the apartments that this is happening at are multi-building apartments. Each, you know, there's eight apartments per building or, you know, for example, where it makes it easier to get access to a specific part of the apartment I think some of the new ones that are being built are buildings with interior access, which in the, in the controlled parking as well with gates and parking garages and stuff, I think that makes it more difficult. Um, and you know, how, how do you lower crime? You deter it. You, you try, to make them, try to make it hard for them to commit crime. And you know, building, and the buildings, they, the high-rise buildings, they look nice. Um, and I think uh, we have a lot less incidents at those style of apartments as opposed to ones that have 20 buildings or 27 buildings or however many. Okay, so we've been talking for a long time about the need to gate additional lighting, other things at apartments. What are we doing to require that? So as a, as a result of, of the leadership on this committee, uh, we have more teeth in our Chapter 27 ordinance to mandate some of these things. Uh, at apartments and at other properties that are contiguous to apartments that also drive risk. Uh, I would say from you know, my knowledge of the, the, the matter and what others have taught of me uh, is that there are other areas outside of apartments that create risk. It, just being an apartment in and of itself uh, is not necessarily a high risk activity, right? So uh, there's a reason we're focused on certain properties. Uh, I think we need to do more of what we're doing at scale. 
that's why we're taking on more properties and uh, we're, we're fortunate to have the bodies to do that. Again, this committee played a large role in, in doing that as well. So I think from a tools perspective and from a um, administrative ordinance perspective, we have what we need. Um, it's time to continue to go pr prove uh, that the concept works. So my concern is that your actions are reactive. You go out after we've had a lot of crime, after you've had a lot of complaints, but we have land use opportunities to require fencing and additional lighting beyond what's happening today. And I think we need to look at how we can deter this before it ever happens. Um, you know, we've, a number of us have done different um, meetings with apartment managers and owners to try to make sure that they know what their obligation is, but clearly the message isn't out. It isn't out in a sufficient way. And I hate having y'all be at risk. I hate our, our residents being at risk. Everybody deserves to live in a safe home. And I think we need to do more and everything we can um, up front before it's ever built so that it's designed in a way that's safe so that that means whether we say we're not okay with the garden style apartments anymore, that we, we need to have that interior, um, that we are gonna require you have a gate or fencing around your property, that the old standard of lighting isn't sufficient anymore, now we need this, that we need license plate readers, whatever it is that you're recommending, we need to get that in our land use so that we're not even building more that don't meet those specifications. Like, let's head it off to begin with. Um, the last question I have for you is really, you know, we're all really proud of the work you've been doing and we wanna see it continue, so what is it that you need to make that happen? Oh. Uh, we need to grow as a department. We need more. Staff. We, we need staff. Uh, you know, when we, when we look and talk about how we move resources around, um, we, need, we need more dedicated staff. That's number one. Uh, we need to continue our, our technology. Uh, we need to continue with our push for cameras, uh, which we are. Uh, but first and foremost, and I know this conversation will come up when we give recruiting, uh, this is a national issue. I just came back from my major city chief's colleagues. There is not a police chief in America uh, that would not say their number one need is more police officers on the street. Uh, we know that we have a plan that shows that when you have a plan and you have more police officers that you can uh, lower the fever. Um, and so I would say our number one is that. Well, let's get you more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, yes, uh, Chairwoman Willis. Thank you, I had a couple of follow-up questions based on a couple of things I've heard my colleagues say. So um, you mentioned nightclubs a minute ago. Are you talking about those that close prior to 2 a.m. or after 2 a.m.? Of, of places where incidents occur. Right, so, so that is a mixture. Um, a lot of those incidents that I currently described a few minutes ago does occur before 2 a.m. Um, primarily when you kind of look at the time of the day when it comes to just uh, shooting incidents, most of those incidents will take place between 10 p.m. and between 2 a.m. Uh, most of them occur on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we do have incidents that occur at clubs and bars. And so a lot of times if there's a conflict, normally the conflict is gonna be at the end of closing while individuals are leaving leaving the location and then there's some type of conflict and it may or may not lead to gunfire okay but you're saying it's across both kinds of businesses or okay um mr odin on the i know that at some of the apartment summits that we've done you've offered to work with property managers and owners to go out and do an assessment of lighting and just other things that can be i guess retrofitted environmental design wise is that on a proactive basis or would we be able to or would your team be able to say or you know looking at, at crime data say we are going to do an assessment of your property so it's both uh there's, there's really three ways we'll do work with you on an assessment basis. Number one, you reach out to us. Uh, we had a property reach out to us from District 4 last month. Uh, our team went in, we gave them all the recommendations we could and, and went that way. Uh, number two, 
uh, is you are a property that uh, is on the teetering point of being designated as a high habitual criminal or habitual nuisance property. And we will go in and do our 60 day engagement. Uh, number three is you are designated as a habitual criminal nuisance or habitual criminal property. Uh, and then our nuisance abatement and our partners at the city attorney's office uh, we'll go in and do a very rigorous and thorough uh, inspection. So we can, we can move through the continuum e any way we want to, really. Okay, um, and last question was around slide 15 um, about place network investigations. And Major Scoggins, you mentioned the use of cameras to help establish probable cause. I think you referred to a drug dealing case or suspected drug dealing. Would these have been cameras that the apartment complex had or that DPD puts in place temporarily? Or what are we using? What's, what's available out there that you're able to use to help with this? Uh, when looking at this particular incident, I believe it was surveillance cameras that the apartment put up. Mm -hmm. uh, when working with some of these apartments, they let us have access to footage uh, come in and watch uh, various different things. So if we have a good idea of time and a day and stuff like that, we can we can watch that footage or sometimes request to burn a copy or something like that. It's just all about kind of the relationships and that access that we get. So I believe that those, the way, the way I saw it was that those uh, belong to the apartment complex and they happen to be pointed in a, uh, an advantageous direction uh, for us to uh, surveil the situation without actually being there. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any mandates around cameras, do we? On, I mean, chapter 27 was, we beefed up lighting, I think, but what's the requirement around cameras? I'll, like, I'll get a direct sides? answer for you on that. Off the top of my head, there's no requirement for cameras in there, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll make sure that's accurate. Okay, all right, food for thought, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Moreno. Thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you for the presentation. The lighting in reference to page 13, is that aside from the mayor's task force on safer communities? No, sir, that's, that's in conjunction with conjunction. that recommendation. Okay, so, so I appreciate what we're doing there and the partnerships that we've been able to do with DISD as well and, and us handling the city side of, uh, aspect and DISD doing their part. When it comes to transportation, I know the way we measure light with the illuminance, sometimes that causes for not a sufficient number of lighting. Has transportation looked at potentially uh, amending that to allow for, for increased lighting, not just a conversion from traditional to LED, but actually adding poles between the distance that we currently have? So I, I personally don't have that answer for you, but I'd be happy to facilitate that conversation and make sure you get that, sir. And then just uh, really want to acknowledge the, the apartment uh, garden style uh, as we continue to urban plan, especially in our entertainment districts with, with design, uh, street closures, lighting, and cameras. I do have a question on cameras. What's the bandwidth if we have apartments that will supply cameras at their cost the technology is there for that to be tied into our fusion center. What's our capacity for how many more cameras one truly could handle? Council member, I, I don't really have that information really available, uh, but that's obviously something. Might have an answer in just a second. Major's coming. Uh, good morning, council members, or afternoon, sorry about that. Uh, correct. So we're actually in the process. Uh, we just did a procurement. Uh, this body approved us a procurement for a solution that will allow us to do that. Uh, hopefully within the next 60, uh, 90 days, uh, we'll be in that process of rolling out how those community partners and businesses are able to provide that uh, methodology of getting us. Uh, and also in collaboration with uh, Deputy City Manager Fortune uh, and working on the Camera Governance Board, it's also going to help connect uh, the other city resources uh, into the real-time crime center. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, any other questions before I ask a couple things? Specifically, you've heard my colleagues already ask about the, the number one thing on my list, which was the 
apartment communities team you know several months ago we focused a lot of attention around that and we had some um, some I think productive discussions around it but I haven't seen a whole lot of the fruits come from that I haven't seen the the outcomes associated with it and even in a presentation like this while I appreciate that the update is that we had um, you know went to a middle school and had a event that's not exactly what I'm looking at when we're talking about how we're impacting crime in the apartments and so you heard some of these things whether it's cameras or lights and other pieces of this you know I'm, I'm hearing at least as it relates to the work done in, in the PSN area project safe neighborhood area um, that as we're getting some more flock cameras delivered and things like that that that's a, a huge piece of this and then um, we're going to be coming online with more of the um, LPRs and a lot of the, the squad cars, and I think that's going to be a huge piece of this. But um, I'm curious as to the apartment communities team, what can we do to ramp up that level of activities? Now, as I finish the question, um, you know, we also talked about on the integrated public safety solutions piece of this, the cleaning and greening and the urban blight abatement piece of this. And when I see the numbers here, 227 substandard structure cases worked. Um, and this is probably an offline discussion as far as breaking that down a little bit more and where we're talking about apartments, where we're talking about single family structures. But when I see 34 code violations rem remediated, I mean, I think we could remediate 34 code violations in this room in, the, in a day. So I'm not, that's, I, I hear what the number, but that's not telling a, a very good story, especially with some of these substandard structures. They're going to have. 60 code violations on one place and so those numbers look severely inferior to what I would hope is coming from the P&I piece of this and the the uh, nuisance abatement piece and the apartment community piece of this so again I can't tell from the presentation are we saying that as some of the trends are changing a little bit where I mean it's, it's what the answer I think we got was it's coming from the conflict and it's coming from some of these things that are really unpredictable and I heard the word random a little bit um, but what are the things we can do that we know are there that we can focus on and I, I still believe and I think I'm hearing some of that from around here it could be in those apartment communities where we're um, making them safer for everybody that's living in and around those areas and and this I'm not saying this is all that's happening but this presentation didn't show that that's happening and so that's, that would be my concern, and, and I'd, I'd, I guess, open it up for comment on that, and, and please also tell me where I'm missing something. So I'll respond to that. Um, the first thing is the, the ACT team, or Apartment Communities team, does work hand in hand with all of the code officers that we have. So typically we have a two code officers to one uh, ACT uh, officer relationship, right? So we're working those properties. And again, we're going to see more happen as I spread them out uh, more through the city. On your second um, piece where, you're, where you discussed the uh, urban blight abatement, when we say 1,594 violations identified, those are notice of violations, right? So I can't just give you a ticket uh, right there on the spot. I got to notify you, give you a remediation. You actually ticket. can give them a ticket right there yeah. on the spot. That I'll stand corrected on that one and we'll, we'll talk about it. Depends on the violation. Where we get to. But sometimes giving the ticket actually gives a lot quicker responses. Some of the violations require notice, but many of them do not. They do if, well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk that one um, on some of these properties. 34 is the number remediated. That was, that equates to uh, 18 that were done through owner compliance and one, or 16 through city intervention. I'll take a look at those numbers and how we're calculating them and how we are uh, reporting them and get that back to you um, and additionally if we need to look at how we're reporting on the act team with the code I just say that those two are very married together and so where we're talking about property successes act very much shares that uh, with the code side yeah I guess I just then for future presentations I'd like us to see that so how many apartments are we touching how many units show us some of the successes of what's happening in those units and because this doesn't do it I mean I, I we got we got a good a good story here and a good one of the good bus which is great um, but as it relates to the sheer numbers of individuals and folks that are living in apartments across the city um, I'd like to see more of the impact and the work that we're doing to reduce crime or to um, improve the quality of life in some of those 
communities. So that's, that's my ask for future presentations, please. Okay, anything else? Okay, with that, thank you for this. We will, uh, anything else, Chief, that you wanna say as it relates to the violent crime reduction plan? No, sir, other than I'll just say, I'll commend the, the men and women of this police department. Uh, they are doing everything that they can with what they have uh, to uh, continue to serve the residents. We'll continue to do that. And they'll, they'll continue to grind and, uh, and uh, work never stops, which is why I say at the end of the year last year, there's no light at the end of the tunnel, there's just another tunnel. Yeah, and to your number one need, we'll move to item D on the ad agenda, <laughs> which is the um, DPD recruiting and retention strategies. Uh, we will, we're going to hold off, if you have questions, committee members, on the DFR recruiting <coughs> retention strategies. Um, just had an unforeseeable event there, and we will hold that till um, next opportunity, but we'll move to the DPD recruiting item now. Good afternoon, uh, members of the Public Safety Committee. I am Deputy Chief William Griffith, Commander of the Personnel Division. I am here today to discuss with you the Department's recruiting and retention strategies. Uh, next slide. Good. Uh, my presentation today will discuss our fiscal year 21-22 recruiting results, the Department's fiscal year 22-23 recruiting strategies, and finally some statistical data on our recruiting and hiring efforts. Next slide, please. Here's the last three years of our recruiting for both sworn and non-sworn. In fiscal year 21-22, civil service received 3,802 sworn applications. From those created an applicable pool of 802. From that 802, last fiscal year, we hired 200 officers. A non-sworn applicant pool of 329, and we hired 142. Out of that applicant pool of 329, we hired 68 for communications alone. In the last two physical years, we have hired 164 positions in communications. We've hired 96 911 call takers and 26 police dispatchers and two senior police dispatchers. Next slide. Part of our recruiting strategies will have the message of one city, one team, together we can. We'll be using our uh, strategies based on data-directed recruiting on the out-of-state efforts for focused on locations with high numbers of existing applicants, such as New York, Illinois, and Puerto Rico. The, we, last year, we went to New York and had an off-site. There, uh, 64 attended that off-site and went into the background process. In the last two years, we have had 129 applicants from D, uh, New York alone. Uh, also, uh, the Dallas Police Department has a great relationship with John Jay University in New York, which is a criminal justice school. In Illinois, in the last two years, we've had 120 applicants apply for the Dallas Police Department. Actually, we went to Chicago this past uh, October and had 22 that went through the applicant process. And this past summer, we went to Puerto Rico for an offsite and had 34 enter into the uh, background process. Currently in the out-of-state, out we have uh, a New York offsite going to occur on March the 14th to the 19th of this year. Um, and we have already had approximately 118 individuals show interest in attending that offsite. In Texas, um, we will win the fight against large agencies. Texas applicants are already familiar with DPD due to the size and name recognition, but we will uh, promote career opportunities of other small agencies do not offer. Our in-state will continue to visit those universities that we've had success with, which include Sam Houston State University, Tarleton State University, University of North Texas in Dallas, and Dallas Community uh, College. In Texas, uh, the major cities that we receive applications from are Houston, Colleen, and Huntsville. Um, uh, currently, we are in the process of conducting an off-site uh, in March, the 2nd through the 4th at McAllen Convention Center. Also, there's some metroplex cities that we do receive application for, 
from are Fort Worth, Grand Prairie, and Arlington. Recently, the recruiter, recruiting team, along with uh, the Department's Police Technology, created a dashboard to keep track of where applicants come from so we can have an idea where we need to recruit. Also, the department uses a website called Handshake to get information on where job fairs are occurring around the country. Next slide. Our recruiting strategies will also focus on diversity. We will continue uh, to develop and relationships with Women's College Coalition, historical black colleges and universities, and Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. We will strengthen the pipeline from the community to the department. The department is, is great uh, uh, in need of homegrown applicants. Homegrown applicants know the area, know the community, and it's very important that we uh, recruit those type of applicants. So we will, we will implement a Pathways Apprentice Program with those three uh, positions, and we will be work closely with the PTEC schools that uh, focus on criminal justice as careers, and those schools are Brian Adams, Carter, and Sunset. Also, we will restructure our, our internship program with the University of North Texas in Dallas. We're working very closely with Dr. Bartula and the University of North Texas at Dallas to uh, firm up that uh, internship program. And also we will reinstate funding for the Dallas Police Department cadet program. Next slide. Also our recruiting strategies will focus on military and vet, uh, veteran recruiting efforts targeted career fairs, and in-person installation visits to increase our presence, advertise in military publications, and work with DPD Military Liaison for the Department of Defense Skill Bridge Program, which I'll talk to you about in just a minute. Also, uh, our, our recruiting efforts will focus on military police. TCO allows military police to be part of our lateral program, which I'll talk about in just a little bit also. Next slide. So part of our recruiting strategies is basically is uh, the Department of Defense Skill Bridge Program. Basically, it's a military internship program. Skill Bridge is an opportunity for service members to gain valuable civilian work experience through specific industry training, apprenticeships, and internships during the last 80 days of a person's military service prior to, re prior to release from active duty. SkillBridge connects service members with industry partners and real world experiences that are designed to aid in the service member in finding meaningful and gainful employment after discharge. We are currently in the application process with the SkillBridge program. The application process takes approximately 60 days. Once the application is submitted, we will send a curriculum to the Department of Defense for their approval. There are currently 23 uh, law enforcement agencies using Skill Bridge program. A few note, Los Angeles Police Department, Fresno Police Department, Shreveport Police Department, and Mesa, Arizona Police Department. Next slide. <clears throat> Additionally, we would, are requesting uh, with the help of civil service to change some military disqualifiers. Currently, civil service only allows military discharge of honorable even if the applicant is using their education to apply. We are working with civil service to change and allow uncharacterized general discharges. Then they can be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Examples of military discharges, uncharacterized general, is recently the military released uh, members of the military for failing to take the COVID vaccine. They were listed as uncharacterized in general. Another example of a military uncharacterized discharge is when a trainee is uh, unable to complete their basic training due to a medical disqualifier or an injury disdain during that training. TCOL now only allows discharges of honorable for military exception. So when civil service makes those changes to uncharacterized general, the applicant will still have to use their college hour as their requirement. Next slide. <clears throat> Part of our recruiting strategies will be restructuring the lateral transfer policy for officers. We'll modify classes for out-of-state laterals, active police officers, abbreviated ca academy classes for TCO licensed officers, and out-of-state laterals can be added to the existing academy classes for obtaining TCO license. 
benefits of this restructured policy is increased lateral applicant pool, shorter academy to streets time, reduced training cycle, and more marketable to lateral candidates. Next slide. As part of changing our lateral transfer policy, we are creating an out-of-state lateral police training team. The, the TCOL has a very complicated process which allows military police or out-of-state law enforcement officers to qualify. By creating this team, we will assist military police officers and out-of-state law enforcement officers work on the process. Uh, after taking the TCOL test and, and they become a peace officer, they will be placed into phase three of training or the latter part of the recruits academy training. The team will consist of one sergeant and four police officers or senior corporals. The team will be quali find qualified candidates, assist in submitting TCOL forms, ensure candidates meet TCOL requirements for changing, for challenging the TCOL, and will uh, be pre-hired five weeks before taking that supplemental peace officer course or, or the lateral uh, police officer course and test. And the lateral team will assist in preparing for that TCOL exam. Next slide. We are also working on uh, reorganizing the recruiting unit. We will have a road recruiting team for in-person recruiting events. Those will be eight recruiters. And we'll have an in house recruiting team for applicant processing and correspondence, which will be two uh, recruiters. And then we'll have a recruiter who will work directly with our PIO for media production, content, and creation and publication. We'll seek an outside firm for ad placement, ex uh, for marketing advertisement firms, etc. Shift a focus from traditional advertising, such as print, radio, billboards, etc., to targeted social media and digital content. Increase presence on existing DPD recruiting social media platforms. Use uh, online virtual meetings such as Microsoft Teams, Skype, and Zoom to speak to uh, prospective applicants. Create posters for hiring events to increase visibility. And work with PIO to create scheduled social media content creation such as Monday mentions, training Thursday, and live video events and will reallocate, re excuse me, portion of our travel budget to pay for social media advertising. Target specific audiences with branded messages. Uh, the department also, though, uh, uses two of the biggest free sites in advertising for law enforcement, and that's TCO and the Tex Texas Municipal League. <clears throat> Next slide, please. We also are going want to create a new Dallas Police Department uh, website, create a new standalone website for recruitment. Currently, recruitment has a web page under dallaspolice.net. We are uh, going to change to a standalone website that are common for other large police agencies such as Houston, Austin, LAPD, and the Tulsa Police Department. The website uh, will have a new and marketable domain as joindallaspolice pd.com or dpdcareers.com. The new website will be additional marketing and recruitment tool for photos, videos, and interactive content. The main reason for the standalone websites, it's basically easier to navigate when we're recruiting. Next slide is a, is a, a front page of our current DPD website. We did make some current updates to our current website. I encourage you all to go look at it. We uh, have made some uh, uh, changes on there that are more adaptable for our applicant pool. Next slide. Also, we want to implement a new applicant tracking system software, purchase a new applicant tracking system, making hiring process and candidate pipeline more efficient, will help structure and organize the hiring process. Software will work as a database with information regarding the applicant, example, track locations of where we are receiving an influx of applicants. We'll assist personnel unit to track the status of applicants during the hiring process, and the applicant will be able to upload necessary documents or information requested by personnel. Currently, we, uh, the, our, the way the system is, the applicant has to bring all their information in by hand to us personally. If, if we get a new software system, we can make that all online, and also a lot of these um, these softwares allow the applicant to look online to see where they're at in the process and see and contact the recruiter directly. So that's what we're looking at. 
Next slide. Formalize a recruiting incentive program, make uh, applicable to sworn and non-sworn police personnel, specify awards and incentives for recruiting sworn and non-sworn applicants. Our current recruiting incentive program only really applies to sworn recruits, one police applicant and their hired DPD recruiting shirt, recruits two police applicants hired recruiting challenge coin, and recruits three police applicants hired permanent award recruiting bar. We want to formalize this uh, for make it uh, applicable to any member of the department, and we're working out some uh, ideas for our monetary recruitment incentive program. Next slide. Here's just a picture of our uh, recruiting coin, the coin that we distribute to when uh, someone's assist us uh, with a, a hiring. Next slide is the recruiting. Uh, uh, pin that we use for uh, sworn to if they help us with recruiting. Next slide. Also, we want to make uh, sure we create a formal non-sworn recruiting strategy, work with civil service recruiter for recruiting non-sworn Dallas police personnel, create managed job postings on employment websites, targeting non-sworn position applicants, involve representatives from the units requesting non-sworn staffing in the recruiting process respond to correspondence, creating ads, and participating in fair events. We did have, we have already started doing that. We had a uh, hiring event uh, for communications this past January in which 22 uh, came to the event. Six applicants were for police dispatcher, one for senior dispatcher. We are working with communications closely on hiring events. The next event is Saturday, April the 1st, which is a departmental-wide non-sworn hiring event. We will advertise for the event through social media sites as we do for sworn. The first event for all nine applicant positions. Supervisors for those positions will be part of the event to answer any questions regarding the open positions they may have. We also have civil service and HR helping as part of that event. We continue to work closely with communications to hire their vacant positions, and we're also working to set the uh, the department at 18% civilian. Next slide, please. There's the list of academy classes. The next one starts on Mar March 4th. So we have uh, five more academy classes for this uh, uh, fiscal year. The next one, March the 1st. Next slide. Retention strategies. Some uh, things we have put in place to assist with retention is the wellness program, wellness unit. We will be focused on physical, mental, and emotional health of the all department of personnel, both sworn and non-sworn. And we have created the Alcohol Rehabilitation Program, which provides employees of the police department 30 days of paid administrative leave to attend the inpatient alcohol support and rehabilitation program. And currently, we are about to launch a monetary retention incentive program for to retain veteran officers, and that should be coming out very soon. Next slide. <clears throat> Again, the, uh, the next uh, few slides will deal with uh, data used by the recruiting unit to create strategies and direct our, our efforts. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, as you can see is the uh, demographics of what we hired last year, um, uh, 64 white, 49 black, Hispanic 68, um, and their percentages. Next slide, please. Here's our top recruiting locations that we have by applicants <clears throat> and the number of hiring events we go to. As you see, Texas is number one, of course. And then we have New York and California are, are second and third, Illinois, Florida. And we just uh, had a, a trip to Puerto Rico during the summer and had 34 applicants. The total number process by DPD. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Here's pr some perspective locations in which we would like to go to. Washington, it's the, especially the Tacoma, Seattle area. Michigan, Georgia, Nebraska, Omaha, uh, Indiana, and Wisconsin. Next slide, please. Here's the most common disqualifiers we do see when applicants are applying for the Dallas Police Department. The top three disqualifiers are drug usage, uh, uh, failed to pass the polygraph exam, and omission or conviction of a previous felony. Next slide. 
Here's a comparison of the city of Dallas demographics to uh, DPD. One to note is uh, female. Our current uh, female uh, employees are 19 percent. We are, the department currently participates in the 30 by 30 program, which is 30% uh, of the department be female by 2030. Um, the department is currently at 19%. The national average is 12% for women police officers and 3% in police leadership. Next slide. Here's some languages that are spoken on the department, Spanish, Khmer, Cantonese, Korean, Kurdish, Lao, Thai and Vietnamese. Next slide. And here's the historical hiring and attrition from 2009-2010 to the current. Um, the most significant number is is between uh, physical years uh, 2015 to 2017 where we lost 420 officers. And next slide. And here's the last two years uh, of uh, st uh, employee strength based on overtime. Overtime uh, budget of 28 million, and the strength the year began was 3,120, year end strength 3,084, physical year 23, overtime budget 28 million again, and year we went with 3,084. At this time, I'll turn it over to Chief Garcia for closing comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I just want to really uh, bring bring this a little bit to scale for us. Uh, you know, and I'll say that this is, as I mentioned earlier, this is a national issue. Uh, this is just not immune uh, to Dallas. Uh, there's actually bills in the United States Congress right now uh, that are looking at ways for retention and recruitment. As a matter of fact, President Biden's executive order, uh, most recent executive order, highlights uh, retention and recruitment. As one of the uh, as one of the goals, uh, I give that for just a perspective that we are in a national hiring crisis for police officers. There is no question about it. If you talk to any of my colleagues around the country, you know I'll say you know as just pointed out, um, you know if we look to page back to page 28, um, and I know I just we can't emphasize enough. You know if you look at years 15, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18 the attrition and the gain or rather losses of those three years are extremely impactful. Um, we're not going to get out of this overnight. Um, we were in a hole uh, and we need to get out of it. I understand, you know, with the tremendous support that we get from our manager's office and the incredible work of the recruiting unit uh, that they do, uh, we just need to continue to drag ourselves out of, of where we're at. But those three years are difficult to overcome immediately. You know, I'll say a few things in final comments before we open up to questions is that we cannot lower our standards. Um, I've been involved in these type of I issues in, in, in other places as well. Um, and I just, I, I, I just, I cannot uh, emphasize enough how we can't lower our standards. Uh, in light of what we've seen in current events, I think it's incredibly important for our profession and only for our police department. You know, I know we talked about with regards to any type of uh, disqualifier that we're thinking about, um, I will look at very, very closely um, if it lowers our standard. And we talked about the general uh, discharge, um, getting a general discharge from the military for refusing to take a COVID vaccine uh, is not something that w should stop you from being a police officer in the city of Dallas. And that, in my opinion, is not lowering our standards. So I just want to make that clear. Um, and then ultimately, again, uh, the amazing work of the men and women, the support that they receive from you. Although our recruiting unit is fantastic, there is no better recruiters than the nearly 3,100 officers that we have currently on this department that continue to sell this department uh, at every turn. Uh, and so we appreciate the support that we get uh, from you all and from Mayor Johnson and our city manager. Uh, and uh, I'll close it out with that while we open up to questions. Uh, thank you for this. Um, I, I'll say when I first got the briefing materials, I was a little surprised that we're down 84 officers over the last couple cycles. Um, with when we're certainly, I think, make, making every step we can to go the other direction, and every budget we have this discussion, and every time we're talking about adding 250 officers and all this, and we're still um, struggling to get those numbers in. And I 
go through the presentation, and all the, from the laterals to everything that we're working on, I think we're working on the right stuff, just we're not getting to where we need to be. And so I, I, I think I can speak for this whole committee that we're willing to do anything and everything we can to get where we need to be. Um, and you know, we'll continue to try to be innovative, but we're, we're kind of banging our heads too, trying to figure out how do we help you. <laughs> Um, and so, as you get answers, please let's, uh, you have our support and let us do whatever we can to help. Um, I know we have quite a few questions and I'll start with uh, Chairwoman Mendelson to my left. Thank you. Um, really, I could have had a briefing just on this and I probably have enough questions for it, so out of respect for my colleagues, I'm gonna try to limit. Um, can you just run through for us, what are the qualifications and what is the recruiting budget? Okay, so our recruiting budget is to hire 250 officers this fiscal year. And since we were short of the 250 the previous year, we'll add those 250 to our, our recruiting goal this year also. And also part of it is um, the uh, 45 college hour credits or military exemption. Uh, if you're at 19 and a half, then you, can, you have 60 hours of college credit. Also, our lateral program allows us to hire uh, police officers who are current law enforcement officers if they meet the TCOL requirements. And so um, what we're trying to do is get officers who have already served as police or are serving as police officers on the department so we can automatically have that experience on, on, on the department. So, Chief, you said you would not like to lower qualifications to be a police officer, 100% agree. Before I was on council, the prior chief did do that. Are you looking at increasing them or restoring them to what they once were? I'll talk to, I'll have to talk to with my staff with regards to that. Um, you know, obviously I don't wanna paint every situation with a broad brush, uh, but certainly we have seen, um, you know, report after report comes out nationally on issues that occur that lowering the standards is not the uh, necess necessarily uh, the most prudent way to build a department because ultimately um, you get issues um, not too different than what we've just seen in the last couple of weeks. Okay, and if somebody could be looking at what the recruiting budget is for DPD, um, you can come back to me when you have that handy. In the meantime, I have a question if you are requiring multiple ride-alongs as part of the application process. Yeah, so what we try to do during the application part, we try to hire these people, uh, pre-hire them before the academy uh, starts, and then as part of that pre-hires, we put them in other parts of the department. One of them is including ride-alongs in patrol. Okay, thank you. Um, do you see a difference in retention of candidates who are from out of state versus in state? Repeat that question again, please. If you see a difference in retention for candidates who came from out of state, versus in-state? I don't think we really looked at that, but we can kind of take a deep dive and look into that to see if we see a difference. Okay, and we've talked a couple times about um, a retention bonus program. Are we gonna talk about that at a different briefing? Yeah, so we're in the final stages and it's, it, I don't think we should, it should be a different time that we should be talking about what the retention uh, bonus is. Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's something that the council approved. We're still working out the kinks and how the policies and, and the procedures for the pro, uh, process. So we're, we're really not at time to make it public yet. Okay, you were talking about the software you're gonna implement and one of the problems being that people can't easily upload documents and things like that. Um, in the meantime, you're still like accepting emails with a PDF attached, right? I mean, you're not making them literally come in, are you? Yes, ma'am. So we are the take, bring it, having them bring in the original documents. Some uh, documents are required by TCO to be the original documents, especially from uh, resumes and some uh, divorce decrees and some other do uh, documents that are TCO requires in the original documents. However, if we go to this program-based it's uh, uh, software that's a legal, it would be said if it's sent to us, it's a legal document. It's the same way like when you buy a house, all those legal documents, it can be uh, Adobe signed and then we can re, re, uh, keep them as that. But currently right now, we have to have all original documents when they come in. So how are you doing that with people who are out of state? 
So when they, when the people from out of state is, we do the application process, they take the test, and then we schedule a, a, a week or an, what we call an applicant uh, board process week. And so usually that's on a Thursday, every twice a month. And so when they come in to go through the process, which basically is your PT and making sign, filling out all the, the applications and make sure they're not disqualified through that process, then we tell, inform them during that, during that interview process to bring all their documents they, they have in with them. And we're paying for that, right? That time that they come for that week? No. No, ma'am, we're not. So at their own charge, they're flying to Dallas, staying here in a hotel, all of that? Yes, ma'am. So that's why we try to have a lot of off-site locations on locations where we have a lot of applicants. For example, New York. We're going to New York in March. When we have that off-site, we will take civil service with, uh, with us. We'll have do all the applicant process that we would do here at the Dallas Police Department there. So they'll have all their documents. So when we go to these out-of-state out of events, we do all that process then so we can get all the documents at time. So basically when we return, the person be put into the back end process. Okay. Did you get that um, recruiting budget item yet? Uh, my name is Martin Riojas, Assistant Director of Finance for the Dallas Police Department. The recruiting budget is $29.4 million. $29 million? Yeah, and that does, that's for the whole training um, unit. So as a, as a whole unit for everything involved with training, that's the budget for, for the okay. whole unit. Yeah. So I would like that broken out. We don't, we can work to get that. That's not a number that I have a report for that I can run, but it would take some study to, to get that. We can break it out. Yes, okay. ma'am. I'm pretty sure it will not take study. I'm really confident that it is broken out. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's really um, two things that I want to say. One is that the big loss of officers happened during the pension issues last time. And I think everyone's pretty clear that the pension issue was not a fix, it was a Band-Aid. And that Band-Aid is leading us to today and to the work that we are about to undergo to actually fix the pension, which will happen in 2025. And my big concern is that we don't repeat the mistakes of those years, because frankly, we don't have the officers to shed. There was a lot of discord between the city council that was in office at the time and the officers, uh, both police and fire, and we can't have that again. I hope we won't. I hope we'll walk hand in hand down to Austin and get the fixes that we need to make everyone have um, a secure future. So with that, um, I just wanna say to the officers, both police and fire, that there are fixes and that you need to stay <laughs> and we need to just work through it together so that everyone is secure. So don't be freaked out that we're talking about pension again. It's not deja vu. It's the next chapter that was always expected. And I think that's an important difference to understand. And your messaging to the people is going to be really important. So I need to say that part. The second thing is about the recruiting. Everything you outlined, I think, was extremely comprehensive. I, I think that our chair was trying to say that yes to everything. But I also want to say that and. And have we looked at outside recruiters that might help bring forth candidates? and paying them just a flat fee? Have we looked at the community? Because maybe there's places you can't reach and paying them a finder's fee. And maybe that finder's fee is for somebody, not for the officer to get, but for the finder. And what that means is that they would pay, they would be paid upon completion of the academy and that the candidate doesn't have a vested interest in just finishing the, the, the school to get the bonus because it's not them that's getting it. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. So internally, we have looked at, uh, at firms to help us with recruiting and, and, and those kind of companies. So we are in the process of kind of looking at those companies and see what they have to offer and, again, the expense of that. Yes, ma'am, we are looking at that. And, and, and I'll just add in some of the incentive to incentivize recruiters. Um, what, what I've seen has worked well also is if you split it up in three ways, you, whatever is the incentive is, you get some of the incentive when they get hired, you get a little bit more of the incentive when they pass the academy, 
and you get the third installment when they pass probation. And in, in some of those things, have I, I've seen that have worked as well. Well, I think, you know, the T-shirt and the challenge coin and the little recruiter bar, that's nice. That's for you. Um, but I don't know that that's going to make anybody do an extraordinary effort, and we need the extraordinary effort. So pairing that with a monetary incentive for already sworn and retired officers, that's great. But you need the whole community to help be on the lookout. You need somebody who is involved in the PTA, and there's a kid who's not sure what their future could be, to go, you know, have you considered DPD? Have you considered DFR? You can have a life of service. And we need people to be thinking about it. And one of the things I think we learned with Dallas Animal Services with their foster care program is they suddenly started paying people to foster care and they got all their animals out. And so, you know what, if it takes money to do it, let's put the money where we're actually gonna get the folks. And so I'm open for new ideas and I hope you are and I hope you'll come back to us with that and we'll say yes, thank you. Yes, uh, Chairwoman Willis. Thank you. So going back to um, the, we know we've got 250 officers to hire this year and then we had a gap last year and I, I know I've known that number. Do you, what is that number of what's the carryover? So it'd be 50 officers. So last year our budget was 200, to hire 250 hours, 50 hours was, was our goal. We hired 200, so okay. we were short 50. So we add that 50 to this year also. So we need 300 this year. I was at a panel um, earlier this year on um, where different police chiefs from around the state spoke, and San Antonio said they have no problem recruiting. Everyone else has problems recruiting, but that police chief said they didn't have problems in San Antonio. And so I don't know how true that is, but um, that might be a good market to look at. <laughs> one of the things that, are, that I talk about, one of the things I, I push back <clears> even <throat> on these congressional bills that are coming out of D.C. is they, they pay a lot of attention to, to recruiting, which is important. Um, but even they're falling a little bit short on the retention portion of it. Mm. And I will tell you that if you were to go to any police chief, uh, major city chief, and say, you know, uh, we hired 200 last year, I don't think any chief would say that was bad. Uh, I think that's very, very good. It wasn't the 250 goal that we had, but we lost 238. And so is the problem recruiting or is the problem retention? Or is it a combination of the two? And so that is one thing that even, again, even that I, that I, that I speak uh, to, the, to the bills that are coming out of Congress to say there's, there's good stuff on the recruiting portion, but not enough on the retention portion. So I would say, you know, I, although we all would have loved 250, you know, I'm happy with 200. I'm not happy with the 238. If you were going to tell me which one of the numbers I'm not happy with, I'm pretty happy and I'm proud of my staff for the 200 particularly in the times that we're in nationally, it's the 238 that, that, uh, that's tough. Well, agreed, and I think we're all looking forward to seeing the retention plan. But um, I noticed on some document, and I'm not seeing it here, that we, there was a focus on Hispanic-serving institutions, our Texas um, universities, and I saw U UT El Paso listed. Texas Tech is also one, and they have a huge alumni base in the Metroplex, and so shoot where the ducks are flying. Um, I didn't see us referencing the five state area, and there may be some reasons for that, but I wanted to let you know, as someone who sits on the Visit Dallas board, in about six months, you're going to see an aggressive ad campaign in some markets around the U.S., don't know where they are yet, but I would encourage some discussion across that, because there are going to be some marketplaces uh, that are being messaged that Dallas is a really amazing place to visit and, and to live, and so I think there could be some synergy in riding on the backs of their ad dollars. I had a question on page 23 on the different markets. So I, I get the proportion of where recruiting effort is versus the number of applicants, but it seems like Florida, we're putting a lot of effort in there and not getting the yield. Are you all looking at changing that? Yes, ma'am. So we're looking at different locations. That's why in that one slide we show some other locations that we want to go to in the future, like Tacoma, Washington, and Nebraska, and some other states. But also, we do recruit heavily in Louisiana and Oklahoma, and so those are two areas that we do go to quite often um, in, in our recruiting efforts, and I'll, I can give you some of the numbers on how many we do get there, from, but we do, but we are trying to change the way or the, the cities and the states that we go to. Uh, you, this is some of the 
in the past have worked for us, but we're kind of evolving and trying to change. That's mm -hmm. why I put that slide in there to kind of show, hey, we want to move to uh, in other cities and states. Yeah, and I don't mean to get into the weeds. It's just when you see something lopsided like that, it begs the question. Then finally, and maybe Mr. Fortune, this is a question for you too, um, on slide 29 where we're talking about what we budget for overtime and then what we know our expense is. There's such a gap there. Um, why aren't we budgeting to that when we know we've got this um, lag in our retention and missing the mark on, on hiring, not because of anybody's fault. I mean, I think we are doing a great job on that, but this is the reality of it. This is the column it shows up in. Yes, ma'am, it's a concern every year. It's a balancing game we have to choose between, um, you know, obviously limited resources. And so, um, you know, obviously these are funding items that we have to take care of. And so, Martin, I'm not sure, but some of this is, I don't know if this reflects some of the ARPA money that is going to be allocated mm -hmm. to this as well. That's yeah. maybe from a separate piece. I just wanted to get some clarification, please. Yeah, this is uh, Martin Real again, Assistant Director in Finance. Um, so the, the overtime budget does include ARPA money. It has general fund money plus ARPA money together. Um, I will say that on the question of overtime, I'll just say that uh, the we propose a budget, but during the budget amendments, often, uh, at least it didn't, not this last year, but in prior years, often there's amendments to reduce it. And so it, it is, you know, I will say that what we request isn't always what is granted. So I, I will just say that the budget does get amended through the process and overtime can be on the table a lot of times. But um, to answer your question about the ARPA, it is included in the, in the, in the budget. And, and just one more thing on that, Councilmember, because I remember having conversations with Martin with regards to it. There are some unfortunate, unfunded, uh, you know, mandates, if you will, in quotes, particularly when we hit uh, challenging times uh, where we need more presence in certain areas. And that's tough to, that's tough to project, um, but certainly those things occur throughout the year. Uh, and oftentimes, if we have to, as an example, on you know, when we, we will look forward to trying to bake these in more with regards to whether it's weekend holidays, or you know, there's going to be certain times where you know where where it's a challenging period of time where we need to deploy more officers uh, because there's a spike uh, that we need to reduce. And I think I think we understand that. And so what I'm getting at is just if we know it's coming, let's budget to it. And I'm familiar with how the budget process works, and I know that last year we did fully fund that. So um, it's just as we go into this next year, if we don't have the ARPA funds to put against it, what's the reality of it? And let's budget to that, especially while we're in this zone. Because I think we know, we've studied it, we know it's valid and needed. Um, so let's just budget to it. Thanks. Okay, um, virtually there's a question from uh, Councilmember Resendez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question that's um, on the recruiting piece, and it's just like in the spirit of not leaving any stone unturned, I know that Dallas ISD um, takes its uh, recruiting efforts internationally, and they go to countries like Mexico, Colombia. I'm wondering, is, is something like that feasible in this space? And if so, what, what are the pros and cons? Okay, so cur currently the requirements to be a police officer in the state of Texas, you must be a U.S. citizen. And so, however, there is legislation in the state legislature to change that. And so hopefully that um, you can be, that you become a, a resident, uh, a, re a permanent resident, you can, can qualify to be a police officer. And that and then we may be able to look at those efforts. There's okay. a, there, one more dynamic, and you know we'll speak to it from Puerto Rico, uh, council member. There were some very qualified applicants from Puerto Rico, but they were not proficient in English. And that is something that, that obviously is a, is a need. And so when we look at the 34, you know, one of the dynamics in, in going to Puerto Rico, you know, it was all those 34 bilingual, uh, which is very different than if we went anywhere else to get 34 uh, applicants. But we are going to be working uh, particularly uh, with Puerto Rico. Um, as an example, to not only try to recruit right away, but try to get some young men and women in the pipeline and letting them understand that, hey, to, to, to come over to the mainland, uh, you, you, know, you have to be proficient in English and, how, and finding ways uh, to help them uh, get proficient in the language as well. Awesome. Thank you for that information. I just think it's a potential avenue to, to, to um, pursue. That, that, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, uh, Councilman Moreno. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you all for the presentation. First, I have to say it's impressive to see the work that y'all are doing with the number of officers that we currently have. So thank you for, for y'all what y'all do each and every single day. Uh, page 25 talks about the applicant interview. Where in the process does an applicant have the interview? Is it at the beginning, the middle, or at the end? The interviews are at the beginning, so during the applicant process. So when they come in for our weekend on-site testing, they do the PT test, um, they do their applications, and then we look for any possible disqualifiers depending on what the application says, and then they have their interview on that Saturday of that week. Can you summarize what an uh, interview looks like? What type of questions are answered? What are we looking for? We're kind of looking forward to see how they would handle possibly a stressful situation in, in, in the real world. But also when we look at them and how they answer those questions to see, not everybody's been a police officer before, so they not have any idea. But we look to see if that applicant is trainable. Can we teach them how on, on if they don't answer the questions correctly or, or what we think? Can we train them to answer the questions quickly? Be able to think on their feet. Decision making is a huge one that we look at to kind of see if they're able to make a decision and stick with it. So those are all the kind of things we look for when we do the interviews. Is there coaching for the training? Do we have outside help for those? And the reason I bring this up, because I, I do understand that a lot of these individuals are potentially it's their first time looking for employment, their first time um, getting a job. Uh, a lot of them, it's their first time that are, are, are going uh, potentially into college. And so how are we ensuring that this isn't the sole indicator for disqualification? How many points is the interview process? Do we have outside help to train uh, or coach for interviews? No, no, we don't have any outside uh, training ability to do that. We're just kind of, based on the questions, we just ask them some general questions about themselves and where they're from and how they're doing, but then we put them in type of uh, scenarios, situations, uh, and we just kind of look and see how they react. And the biggest part of this interviews is their decision making to see how, and, uh, how they uh, make decisions and uh, move forward. So that's how we do it, but we haven't used any outside to prepare for the exam. Yeah, part, part of it also is we give them a placard and we have them ask them, there's like 10 uh, areas, and we ask them to look at it for a couple minutes and to memorize what it is. And so basically it's, you know, how to react to a stressful situation. You know, you call for cover, you, you, you help your partner, you help yourself and all these. And so we ask them to look at the card, see how their memory is. Also, we test their memory. So we have them look at the placard for a couple minutes and then we ask them right directly afterward to recite in order uh, what you were ju you just read. That's another part of the testing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions on this item? Seeing none, um, appreciate you, and obviously hugely important topic. Um, we'll be here ready to support as needed. Um, let's move to item E, Overview DPD Youth and Senior Programs Initiative. Mr. Chair, as uh, team switches out here, we have uh, Assistant Chief Jesse Race. He's going to provide a quick overview of some of our DPD youth and uh, senior programs. This item we placed on the agenda, I think there's another committee who's requested some of the same information. I just wanted to make sure we communicated accurately to this committee the type of things that we'll be presenting. Chief, go through this pretty quick, and then, and then obviously they've had a chance to read it, and then um, we'll certainly have uh, time for questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, Assistant Chief Jesse Reyes over at the Community Engagement Bureau. Um, you heard Mar Major Scoggins talk earlier about uh, the violent crime plan, and obviously the majority of that conversation is doing the weeding part. Um, but they're also the second half of the violent crime plan is the seeding part. And so what, what we're going to talk about today is, is the seeding portion of what youth and senior programs we have. I'll go uh, kind of skip through the overview. That's pretty self-explanatory. Most of this uh, presentation is self-explanatory. Just as a way of background, Office of Community Affairs established was established in 1987. Uh, DPD PAL uh, became an actual charter member of National PAL in 2017. Uh, <clears throat> on page, on slide five, you'll see some of the youth programs we have available. I'll just talk, talk briefly about each one of those. Uh, slide six, we're talking about the uh, Dallas Explorers, which was established in 1973. It's for 
youths from 14 to 21. Currently, we have 15 active members. Uh, prior to uh, the COVID period, we had quite a few more members, so we're, we're in the process of trying to build that number back up. Uh, the most important stat on there, you look at the last bullet, we have over 200 explorers that have joined DPD or the law enforcement agencies since in its inception. Uh, we also realize that uh, it's better for us and, and the community if we uh, sometimes uh, mentor these, these individuals before their 14th birthday. So on the next slide, you'll see the Dallas Junior Police Explorers, which we established in 2010, and it's for ages 9 through 13. Uh, currently have 21 active members, and one of the most important things there is that they learn, obviously, through our mentorship, um, leadership, teamwork, friendship, and they also provide service to the community. Um, next slide, we're talking about Blue in the School, which is an uh, offshoot from the original D.A.R.E. program, LEDS program. We established Blue in the School in 2013. Uh, it's being taught to third graders as part of the curriculum. Currently, we're at Hawthorne Elementary and Mount Auburn Elementary, and this semester we're, uh, we have 118 students going through the class. Um, again, teaches decision-making, self-confidence, dealing with peer pressure, and conflict management. Uh, Chief Griffith mentioned the uh, P-TECH earlier, uh, partnership with the ISD and Texas Education Agency. We have uh, our instructors teaching criminal justice curriculum, and uh, it is for grades 9 through 12th, and as Chief Griffith mentioned, we're at Carter, Sunset, and Brian Adams currently. Next slide is talking about our police, police Activities League, which at one time was a police athletic league. Uh, we found out that not all youths are athletes, so we've changed that to Activities League. Uh, we provide, uh, one of the programs we provide is on slide uh, 11, the boxing program. We have two different locations, J.C. Turner Rec Center and the Forest Aldelia Center. There's two different categories for boxing. There's the um, individuals that just want the boxing basics, come in there and learn some of the basics and try to get in shape. And then we have the com competition boxing, which uh, these kids can attend tournaments throughout the country. Uh, we've also established a disc golf uh, program, which I was not very familiar with, but apparently uh, a lot of the youth are attracted to that. We uh, play it year round at different city parks in partnership with Parks and Recreation. Last year, we involved 363 youths in that program. Uh, our horsemanship program, uh, partnership with EQuest on Pemberton Hill. Uh, it's a 10 to 12 week school offered in the spring and the fall. Uh, instruction is led by uh, EQuest. And in 2022, we reached 123 individuals. We also have a music program, which we're currently at two schools, St. Phillips uh, School and Seagaville Middle School, taught twice a week during the school hours. At St. Phillips, we're, ta uh, we're mentoring children in, um, who are working towards a musical to be performed at the end of the school year. And at Seagaville, we're instructing on uh, the use of a guitar, electric guitar, and electric keyboard. Uh, the next program is the Junior Police Academy, which is a, a three-day-long classes, which we hold annually. There's a ba basic academy from 4th through 8th graders, advanced academy from north 9 to 12, and basically that's a hands-on instruction on various specialized units in the department. Uh, you can see some of the uh, units that participate, SWAT, investigations, motorcycles. Uh, recently they had a, um, a drone class also. For senior activities, we we do not have anything that is a departmental-wide program, but what we do have is our neighborhood police officers that deal in each individual division, uh, develop and maintain relationships with their established senior groups in the communities. They host events that are tailored to the specific needs, including senior and health safety fair. I know Southeast is having a Valentine's luncheon. Uh, we also have, obviously, involvement in crime, which crime watch groups, and volunteers in patrol. We also, as MPOs, present crime prevention and safety awareness programs, uh, presentations, fraud and financial crimes, robbery, and I theft identity. Uh, and I know, Chairman, uh, we talked at the last uh, public safety about individual numbers and what they actually mean, what do we get out of it. I will tell you, through our partnership with Dallas County and our contacts in the community this past uh, 
I guess earlier this month when we had the five-day ice storm, we were able to provide uh, seven elderly individuals in our community with heaters that they otherwise, heater, heating sp space heaters that they otherwise would not have had re a heating source. Uh, and again, that's uh, through our partnership with Dallas County. And as for our next steps, uh, obviously want to continue the current programming, uh, increase the number of programs we have available to seniors departmental-wide, uh, love to double the number of boxing locations, and uh, in your agenda, you should have a memo from uh, IPSS. Uh, we're obviously, we want a partnership with them um, regarding some of their summer initiative programs. And finally, the Quality of Life Committee uh, has asked for a memorandum memo random presentation at their next meeting. Uh, as before I open it up to questions, there's two things that I'd like to mention. Uh, the majority of youth programs obviously deal with mentoring. And for m when you mentor individuals, you don't get the immediate results you would get. Uh, you don't see the immediate results. So that's an ongoing process that obviously need to continue going forward on that. And then for the chair and vice chair, I, as I was putting this presentation together, I did notice one thing. We have a very strong present, uh, partnership with the ISD. The challenge going forward is to work with the other ISDs in the city. Uh, so I know um, you guys would notice that, and I certainly noticed it as I was putting that together. So that going forward, that was one of the things that we want to continue to work on is work with the other uh, ISDs in the city. So with that, I'll open up for questions. To that last point, it's very easy. I'm happy to help. Um, yes. Chairwoman Mendelson. Well, as it turns out, we were actually talking about that. Amazing. Um, so I just do want to confirm. So it's the Back the Blue program that's DISD only right now and the Pathways program are both DISD only? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Well, I just think it's, you know, if this is what DISD needs from DPD and other districts don't, I'm perfectly fine with providing it. It's just that when our other districts do ask for specific help, we also want to provide what they need, which may not be exactly the same issues. So um, thank you for that. I want to ask you sort of the big questions, the how and why. Um, how do these programs help you, and why do you do them? Well, again, the, the big, I guess, answer, the main answer is the mentoring program. Obviously, the, the, soon, the sooner we can mentor individuals, the better relationship we build with them. As they grow older, uh, they're more familiar with what law enforcement does as a whole. Um, obviously, they learn the citizenship issues. They learn how to work together. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about the benefits of it. And so this is why we do it. I mean, obviously, the more we mentor, the better off we're going to be in the long run. So are you seeing this as crime prevention, or are you seeing this as recruiting, or both? I think it's both. I, I'm, thank you for asking that question. I think it's a, a little bit of both. As we talk about the Explorer program, obviously, with the number that I put out there, over 200 have become police officers. It's a great recruiting tool, tool. but even if, if an individual chooses not to go into law enforcement, I mean, obviously the mentoring, uh, the citizenship, the, what they provide to the city in the long run is a benefit for everybody. Okay, I agree with you on that. Um, can you tell me for the horsemanship, are they also helping with the horses that um, are part of our mounted patrol? So our mounted patrol does um, offer assistance. I thought I'd put them in there if I did. It looked like everything was at the horse park, not at Yeah, um, so, so actually it is at the horse park. Our mounted unit assists in the training, though. Okay, but perhaps we could ask them to, maybe they would like to be able to help at the stables, I don't know. Um, the one that puzzled me, actually, I'll tell you, is the music program. So I knew about Frisbees, I actually spoke to your drone group, um, but tell me about the music program. So the music program, obviously, uh, we've had for a while. We have a couple of individuals within uh, the unit that enjoy music. Uh, and so prior to COVID, they were at several schools. Uh, things changed for us during the pandemic. Obviously, we didn't have that one-on-one -on -one in person relationship. So we're back in the process of building that. But as I mentioned earlier, when we had the police athletic league, we realized that not every youth is going to be an athlete. They have other interests. and so. Uh, the music obviously sprung up as one of those other interests, and so, like I said, they're currently at uh, Siegelville Middle School teaching guitar, electric guitar. So you're looking at it mentoring through music? Yes. Got it. A well, any opportunity we have, whether it's music, horsemanship, athlete, uh, athletic event, I mean, wherever we can mentor, I think we're better off for. 
hey, as a band mom, I'm all for that. Thank you. All right, any other questions on this item? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will move to item F, the public safety dashboards. Mr. Chair, we have staff available for questions um, in light of the time. We'll just be, be available should, we be, should it be necessary. Okay, I see one light on. Chairwoman Mendelson. Thank you. Um, so in your memo, Mr. Fortune, you um, talked about a couple of different things, and one of them is um, the number of runs that we're asking for DFR to, to um, accomplish. And I'm wondering if we've had any consideration of, um, of, of what we respond to. So I frequently will hear um, somebody from DFR say that they are being used for many of the nursing homes to go and pick up seniors when there's staff at the senior facility that could have done it, but they don't want the liability, so they're putting that on us. And so I would be open to looking at when we have large scale senior facilities that clearly have the staff to do it and there's no other medical emergency other than the fall itself, meaning they're not saying, you know, there's a broken bone, there's something like this, that perhaps we have some consideration that we aren't always picking up every senior, that we ask the staff to do the job that probably people are paying for. Thank you, uh, Councilmember. I know that Chief Artis has been looking at this issue specifically, and they're, they're, I don't know, Chief, if it's, it's something you can discuss at the dais today, but um, please give some background as you can. Good, good evening. I'm Dominique Artis, Fire Chief, City of Dallas. Yes, we are looking at this with our medical director, having him reach out to those type of facilities to see if we can somehow get some kind of consensus around uh, that particular question that you were saying. Uh, we definitely don't want to just leave a senior on the, on the ground there, especially if they're in pain. Uh, we want to check them out and do all we can. But at the same time, we're trying to make sure our resources are not used uh, for something like that. And so we've just begun to look into that with our uh, medical director, as well as we've seen some of the, the local providers that used to provide this service has pulled out of our region, so, uh, which causes a more of a burden for DFR. And so as we go deeper into this, I'm sure we'll find a solution and we'll have to get back to you on that one. Okay, and I'm just gonna say this as the daughter of somebody who had a fire department pick, I mean, they literally picked my father up this past week. So I think there's an important um, role to play if there are other medical things, but if you are just slipping and you are not harmed, I think there's a different issue. And it sounds like there's a lot of um, non-medical issues associated with it from what I'm hearing from officers. So the second thing is, it's very clear the top calls that we have for DFR are for motor vehicle accidents. And I'm wondering how we can connect with transportation to address locations that have our most critical accidents and putting those as priority for our transportation dollars so that we can eliminate those for both the victims as well as, as for y'all. Yes, um, Chief, Chief Artis again. Uh, we're working through a couple of different programs with transportation. Uh, one of them is uh, the preemption technology to change the lights and to, especially when you have emergency vehicles coming through the scene. We're also looking at uh, the possibility of how we respond to those a little bit differently up in the next, co next couple of months. Uh, looking at how we send out different pieces of equipment on different types of runs. Uh, we're reviewing that. Uh, sometimes I feel like we oversend uh, some things out on emergency runs that could be assigned to different incidents. And so as a team, we're going and pulling all that data together as well as looking what other cities are sending out. And then we're gonna make a determination if we need to change some of that information. We're also partnering with um, transportation to look at those areas that we feel that seem to have more accidents than others to see if it's something different we can do in those areas with them. So, so thank you, Chief and, and Council Member. We have had those discussions. Um, I am not in a position to tell you how they've prioritized and made um, some changes, but I know accident data is definitely a factor in when they're looking at designing and maybe redesigning 
a, a particular intersection, for example. And so I'll follow up with uh, that team just to make sure that the level of coordination is there that needs to be. Great, thank you so much. Um, those are all my questions for F. All right, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we will now move to the memos. We have several memos here uh, from legislative updates, the Community Violence Interruption Program, the Dallas Fire Rescue Construction Project Update, um, other agenda items. So any questions on any of them? It looks like uh, Chairwoman Middleson is up first. So I just have one question. It's on I, which is about the, um, the construction update for the fire stations. And it might actually be for you, Assistant City Manager. Okay, um, so there's quite a few um, stations in there that are saying that they're waiting for inspections. And I'm wondering if we do any sort of prioritization for public safety of our own city. I hope so. Uh, that that I, I'd have to check and see with the inspection department to find out. So I think the answer is no, we don't. And I think we should. And I, I know that, that when we're working with the bond program, the bond office, that there's, there is a specific level of coordination that is occurring, but I can't speak to what that is. So I don't know that the answer is that they aren't prioritizing. I just don't know the answer to the question. Okay. Well, I would definitely like to know that answer. And if we're not getting priority for public safety within our own city, then I would like to know how we can accomplish that. Like, what do you need to hear from city council to say, no, if there's a public safety need for an inspection or a permit, we do that first. Because I Chief, think you would hear that from us. This is Chief Artis. Um, we've been working with the bond construction group for uh, quite a while on a lot of these items, and we have been successful in getting some of the inspections uh, updated in a timely manner. Uh, what has been happening here lately is is that we are need uh, particularly equipment to come in so they can finish out the systems. And so that's what's been kind of backlogging us on a lot of these projects and getting them finished. Well, it looks like from your memo that you're really waiting on inspections. Yes. And it's, on and it's, it's dictated because um, they can't inspect unless the water meter is ready, but the water meter is not ready because the particular item didn't come in for the inspection to be completed yet and things like that. So it's, it's kind of tied to a bunch of little different things. Uh, with the hopes of this month, we'll get two stations open and then we'll have the big openings here shortly, okay. hopefully. Well, so adding to your comment then, I would also like to know in addition to inspections and permits, also water, meaning our own city shouldn't be hampering our own public safety efforts. So if you have a supply chain problem, that's something different, I get. But if our own city is slowing down our ability to open up a fire station, that's a problem. No, water has been one of our best, uh, one of our best to help us get things done. Okay. And we use that water quite a bit when we have these fires. So they are uh, one of our best uh, people to work with. They also prioritize making sure that we get things done. Uh, it's just been trying to get different uh, equipment in. Uh, for instance, Station 36, we're waiting on the, the actual plugs to be able to plug into the apparatus because we don't want to pull the apparatus in and can't charge them, and then we have a delayed response. And so things like that is what has been causing us a lot of consternation in getting these things done. How about 58? 58s was the same thing. It went through a, an inspection, and they found actually a, a collapse, uh, sanit one of the sanitary drains. And so because of that, you have to dig it up, redo it, and it takes 30 days for that concrete to cure. Okay, thank you. Chairman Thomas. Yeah, mine is uh, related to uh, item H. Hi, right, Kevin. First, thanks for the um, the call we had the other day, me and um, Chair Magoo. Uh, 
after reading the memo, if you would um, kind of share some of the information that you shared with us uh, with the committee um, and also, uh, well, let's start there and then I just have a couple more points. Absolutely. So as we've gone down the trek of providing violence intervention services in our city, we've learned a lot. I think that our peer cities have also learned a lot and we've learned from them in turn. And so we're at a point now where as we conclude <coughs> Uh, the first two-year contract we have on violence intervention to focus our services and in many ways expand what we're offering on four tracks. Uh, the first of those is intentionally uh, working in hospitals to serve victims of violent crimes. Uh, the second is to continue to provide summer enrichment programming uh, to students that may not have other activities or experiences during the summer months. The third is to invest in our parents of our youth uh, and helping to uh, break cycles of um, arguing with children or improving school attendance. Uh, and then finally is to continue to support our violent crime plan and the focused deterrence program uh, through, our, through our efforts and some of our contracts in IPS. Mm -hmm. So talk about the funding. So the council has been very gracious. Uh, there's an $800,000 item in my budget or in our, our department's budget to provide violence intervention services uh, dating back to 2022. We expect that, or 2020, we expect that to obviously continue. We'll see how the next year's budget deliberations go. Um, but we're able to provide these expanded services with the money the council has made available to us. Mm -hmm. So, so you currently have the funding to go forward with uh, four individual RFPs? I wouldn't classify them all potentially as RFPs, but okay. all four of these programs, absolutely, yes, sir. We, we have the money to launch them, uh, and you know, we'll obviously assess where we're at and if we've got ability to expand programming right. under that as well. Right, so you said not necessarily RFPs. So explain how, how these initiatives would be funded. Well, fund it all. You want to take that, sir? Kevin, I was just going to see if you could also mention the NLC program, the grant that was going to help supplant, excuse me, support this, this program. Yes, sir. Thank you. So uh, the council accepted in, I believe, June of last year a grant from the National League of Cities uh, that is funded privately by Wells Fargo. Uh, and some of, or, well, all of those funds will go to supporting our violence intervention efforts. So everything that we'll be doing is either already budgeted by the council and general funds or will be supported by those grant funds, which again, we've already accepted as a city. Okay. Well, my question was how will, how, how will that, because you said not necessarily RFPs, how will those four different programs uh, be allocated? Will it be an open procurement process? How, how will that go? Because- Oh, the, yeah, ab absolutely. So the, the first item, um, where we talked about hospital-based response, that'll obviously be a procurement and we'll follow um, the model that, that procurement sets for us with that. Uh, the same can be said for the summer enrichment programming. Um, both of those we're already working hand in hand with purchasing on. Uh, the third item is more of a service that we will be able to provide uh, internally with staff as well as with partners in the community. Um, and then finally, the fourth is actually already operating with an existing contract uh, that we have as well as uh, Sandra and, and I give a, a credit to Lieutenant Alley and the police department. They're already very closely working together. So number three and number four, I do not expect additional procurements to occur. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, that's all I have at this time. All righty, thank you. Hearing nothing else, any other questions virtually? With that, it is 3.44 and we will adjourn the Public Safety Committee meeting for today. Thanks.